This meeting is being recorded by NORCAM and our town administrator. We'll call the meeting to order at 7 p.m. I'm joined by my colleagues, Mr. O'Leary, Mr. Walner, Mr. Studo, and Mrs. Gonzalez, and we will begin with the recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our fourth, first order of business is to discuss the town election and sign the town election warrant. And we are joined by our town clerk, Barbara Statz. Um, so welcome, you are muted. How's that? Perfect. Thank you for reminding me. So we are here again. Of course, the election is around the corner in about three weeks. And, um, you know, the signing of the warrant is certainly the normal occurrence for this. So, but what I'm asking again this year, I've, I've sent you all a memo requesting that we limit the hours again this year for the town election, you know, considering the circumstances that we're still in you know, with the pandemic and the state of emergency. Um, I have uh, given you uh, a brief uh, overview of the reasons that I'm asking this. I mean, obviously the CDC um, is still cautioning people about gatherings and uh, being careful. And we just wanna ensure that we do keep our election workers safe. Um, this is an uncontested race as it was last year. We had a record low turnout last year. Um, and now this year we do have vote by mail in place. That was something that this board was very interested in pursuing through the legislature as were the voters. Um, the legislature has continued unrestricted vote by mail through all municipal elections through June 30th to give people the opportunity to vote safely from home. So that is certainly in place. We do have that available right now. We have links on our website for, so people can take advantage of that opportunity. Um, I'm anticipating uh, a low turnout for this election. I think that people that are interested in voting will probably take advantage of vote by mail. Uh, certainly advertising, if we limit the hours now and advertise it, they'll be well aware as they were last year of the hours to vote. And um, uh, that is what I'm seeking. I'll, I'll wait for some of your input and then we can have a discussion on it. Okay, and I think you did say this, Madam Clerk, but you're proposing that we um, set the polling hours for, from 12 noon to 6 p.m. That is correct. That is what we did last year under the statute. And this is not a statute that was enacted last year due to COVID. This opportunity to limit um, or set varied polling hours is in the statute, you know, all the time. We've never sought to take advantage of it when even with we knew it would be a, a slower election and a, probably a lower turnout. But under these circumstances, I just feel that we have managed to keep our election working exactly. at very trying times last year. I want to continue to do that. If we do the polling hours still from noon till six, that would just allow us to have one shift of election workers. Um, it limits the time for a break where they won't have a full um, supper break where they gather together too. Um, and, and of course they are mindful, you know, we, we do our best and everybody wants to stay safe, but it's just a matter of being smart again. It, to me, it's no different than our planning for outdoor town meetings. We want to try to exercise the cautions that we can that are in our power to do so. And um, so that is what I'm looking for. The um, and you're asking also, uh, so just I just want to make sure the board understands and that the map that anyone that's attending understands. And I'm sure that this, if depending on the vote, will be 
publicized all in your usual manner anyway, but so it's the polling hours from 12 to six, which you've already explained that. And you also mentioned the unrestricted uh, mail-in ballot Correct. so that you don't need a reason you can mail, you, you're allowed to do this and that's been extended due to COVID. So Correct. that's another method of voting. And when are those ballots available? We have them in right now. We so anyone can obtain a ballot and vote and mail that into you or drop that off at the drop Correct. box that's in front of the in front of the um, the town hall. Town hall. Yep, okay, so part. let so let's see if anyone has any questions or comments with regard to this because we do have to take a vote on this. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Walner. Uh, no, sounds we did it last year. Let's do it again. Okay, Mr. Studo. All set, Mr. Mr. Studo's all set, Mr. O'Leary. Um, I think I think the hours should be expanded a little bit, maybe you know, ten o'clock in the morning, uh, because there are a lot of people who are out, you know, from nine o'clock on, ten you know, nine ten o'clock in the morning, and I think we should, uh, you know, just expand it. Start at ten o'clock rather than noontime to provide people the opportunity to vote uh, mid mid to late morning. Um, the six o'clock too, I'm a little bit hesitant, but I think that's okay because I think still a lot of people are working from home. And for those that are commuting back, commuting again, and again, traffic is picking up, I have noticed, um, you know, they'll have the opportunity to do the mail-in ballot. But uh, I, think, I think a 10 o'clock start uh, would be more reasonable and accessible for people. Mrs. Gonzalez? So I was going to make the same kind of a comment. Um, I know myself, I like to vote in person. It's just something I like to do. And I don't get into town until six or after because I do commute. So um, I would like to see it at least go to seven and allow people time to get home from work and be able to go in and vote in person if they'd like to. Okay. Um, all right. That comment, ma Madam Chair? Of course, Madam Clerk. Uh, you know, the, I, I understand those um, arguments or those concerns. Uh, if we do expand it, just so you know, one of the reasons that I'm trying to limit it is to keep it to one shift of election workers. Once we, you know, start expanding the hours, um, then I would have to consider either, you know, probably going to two groups, you know, because then it becomes the election workers will show up between a half an hour and an hour ahead and their day doesn't end when the polls end. They are there till for another half hour or hour afterwards. So that is the reason that I suggested the 12 to six. That's how it worked last year. It worked very well last year. I understand what you're saying and um, I, I can fully appreciate it. I'm trying to let you know what my logic is in, in requesting that I, the hours that I do, because this means that if we run the election from 12 to six, they would be there at 11 and they would likely leave at eight. You know, so that is you know, a long day for one shift. Um, and as I said, it's likely that to extend those hours, I would then have two shifts of workers, which is one of the things I am trying to to um, you know, wrap in and, and just control how many of the election workers are going to be exposed at the election. Okay, Madam Clerk, would that be the case if you ex if we voted to extend it from ten to six? I believe that I I would probably still because they would have to be there at nine in the morning and they wouldn't be leaving till seven, so that would be a ten hour day. Um, I think that's a lot to so you ask. need two ships of workers. I would, that. I would, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, I'm okay with two shifts. I mean, to me, to me, it's accessibility. And, uh, and I think more and more people are, are getting out, you know, more people are vaccinated and uh, more people are out there. Well, know, I, would, before. I would agree with you that more people are getting out and certainly more people are vaccinated. Um, but even last year, you know, I think you saw the numbers that I presented to you that we had a total of 290 voters for the day, including all the mailed 
early voted ballots and absentee ballots. And that came down to 238 people walking into the polls on election day. That's, that's all we had. Um, this ballot is, as I said, the same as that one. Uh, there are no contested races. There's no ballot questions. There's no open seats. That's another determining factor. Had any of those uh, conditions existed, we wouldn't even be having this discussion. You know, if there was even one open seat, one contested race, anything, we would just go with our regular full hours for sure, because you just never can anticipate, you know, who would be um, interested then. Well, after the, so trash I, after the trash discussion tonight, we might have some write-in candidates. We'll see. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think we had a total of seven last year, Mr. O'Leary. <laughs> so it no, was... Just, uh, uh, to, to me, the ballot, whoever's on the ballot or who isn't on the ballot or contested or not, shouldn't necessarily be driving our, our thought process in relation to accessibility to the ballot. So, um, okay. All right. I think... I, I think just from my perspective, I think I have a, I think at least the majority of the board, I, I'd be, I'd be of the same uh, mind as Mr. O'Leary and Mrs. Gonzalez in terms of uh, expanding it a little. I understand what you're saying, Madam Clerk, but I do think them, we probably have a majority vote to do those, to do beyond the 12 to six hours at least, or from, from at least 10 to six, but let's just try to get a consensus on that so that we can take a vote on this. Um, and Mrs. Gonzalez, what were the hours that you were, you wanted? I would love to see it at least be till seven and give people who are commuting uh, the opportunity to get in there. So 10 to seven? Yeah, or oh, I mean, that I was fine with the 12 to seven, but- um, Oh, okay. I, I would like to see it extended on the other end for people who are, are working again. Okay, uh, and Mr. Walney, you are fine with 12 to six as proposed. Yes. Mr. Studo, you are fine with 12 to six as proposed. Uh, yeah, but the ex I would be fine with the expanded if, if we can do that. Okay, and Mr. O'Leary, you- I'm fine with 10 to seven, let's- 10 to seven, okay. So do we have a motion? Um, yeah. Madam, Madam Chair, <clears throat> I want to read this right. Sorry. Oh, we have a hand up. Just one. <laughs> yeah, looking for that the motion, which you're going to have it. to modify, Miss Mister Studo. I think I know what you're going to say, Mister Gilberto. You added a motion to the shareholder <laughs> later, late later this afternoon. Was that what you were going to say? No, I was going to say that we ha we have a motion that calls for the board to vote to sign the warrant as printed. Yes. So you would need a motion to change the time and then a motion to sign the amended warrant. So the okay. warrant itself that uh, I brought to the town administrator's office that's probably in your packet does not have the hours uh, listed. I left that blank pending a vote tonight. Can I say it in one or does it have to be two separate? I think you could do one motion. Um, it would be the motion as printed, um, and to and to set polling location hours as 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Okay. Is that, right? Is that what I heard? Uh, Madam Chair, I move to sign the May 4, 2021 town election warrant. May 4th. Is that right? May 4th. May 4th. No. May 4th. Yes. Okay, it's okay. It's I see, as printed, and also for the polling hours to be from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Okay, motion by Mr. Studo. Do I have a second? Second. Motion by Mr. Studo. Second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. Walner. I'll support the majority. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. And Manu Pelli is aye. Okay. Madam Clerk, was there anything else you were 
I think you did a good public service announcement for us. <laughs> and you'll be publicizing. So Yeah, it's on, it's on my website too. I mean, of course, everything but the hours, you must the availability of the ballots is there, links to the applications, uh, instructions to just submit a letter. Um, everything's up there already. I put it right, right front and center on my homepage. I just want to remind the board that we do need to um, arrange for you to come in and now physically sign this warrant. Yes. Okay. So yes. whatever the consensus is, um, you know, I'll wait to hear from the administrator's office. Okay. I, I, and then I, we can get it posted. Great. And did I see a 15th deadline? Did I see that as a date? April 15th, you needed to sign by or can it be delayed till next week? No, I would like it to, I would like it signed this week. We, you know, I just need to, I would like to wrap this up and get this signed this week. So I'm we can just, get the constable to come in and, and post it. Yeah, I'm in Florida right now. So I don't know if we can do that somehow remotely, but I'm in Florida. So I'll be here all week. I'll be available tomorrow morning, Barbara, if it's ready. I don't okay. know how soon. Yep. I mean, I'm, I'm there. <laughs> I can do it tomorrow also. Okay. I'm sure we can... We'll work out, Mr. Walner, and to my colleagues, we can work out a signing time, um, you know, through the town administrator. And it's maybe that we, we won't be able to all go in at the same time, clearly, because we have well, to be there at the same time. <laughs> it would be we nice, right? You yeah. and distance you. Right, right. You know, if, um, if we can arrange the same day, that's helpful for when okay. we you know, finalize the warrant so that there's one one date of the vote and one date for the signing. And that would be okay. helpful. But whatever we have to work that out with to the town administrator on depending on people's schedules. Okay. As we know Rich isn't here and you can't virtually sign that. You're out of state. I'll I'll be here on Monday if that helps. And Madam Chair, there's one other matter on the on the agenda that the town clerk will be participating in. Maybe if you want to take it out of order so she doesn't have to hang around all night. Oh, we'll thank you, Mr. <laughs> well, I'm Well, we, we had yet to get to that. So, but, but uh, are the members available on Monday to stop by? I could do Monday. Yeah. Okay. Miss, is that work for you, Mr. O'Leary? Or... I think so. Are you Monday, Monday is on a Monday. holiday. Monday is a holiday next weekend. Yeah, so that doesn't work for any of us. No, um, doesn't work for me. Yeah, <laughs> because, because <laughs> holidays. Be there. Uh, holidays. It, it also wouldn't be the it wouldn't be the first time that all signatures weren't on the on the. No, it would party. not. It yeah. would not. So it's, it's not critical. I mean, uh, the vote will reflect that you yes. unanimously voted, and then the signatures. Okay. As long as we have three. All right, and I think let's move on. We're gonna jump over because we do have a 7.30 um, public hearing, but let's jump over to the Board of Registrars, the appointments for Board of Registrars. Mm -hmm. So again, um, this is for a three-year term, a full three-year term. It is um, sadly filling a vacancy created by the passing of Gloria Mastro, who was the current holder of this seat uh, as a Democratic representative on the Reg Board of Registrars, um, whom we certainly will be missing. Um, but it, uh, her term was set to expire in April of this year. So this is an appointment for a full seat. Under mass statutes, the party, uh, town political party whose seat it is, uh, votes to present the names uh, or recommends the names of uh, one or more registrar candidates to the board for appointment. So they have met and uh, are recommending Mr. Dan Greenberg to fill this seat. And I'm sure Mr. O'Leary as the board of registrars liaison probably has contacted Mr. Greenberg. We all know Mr. Greenberg very well. Yes, <laughs> yes. So, all right, so are we, do we have a motion? And Mr. Greenberg is actually present at the with meeting us. Me too. I saw he's that. With yeah. us. Yes, he is. <laughs> but he may not be aware that we're taking it off right now. No, we don't have a motion, but I can. Uh, no, it's, not in, it's not in the packet, but I can. It might be there were, uh, I think, a couple of other appointments further down on the agenda. Uh, I see. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Thank you. Yes, here it is. Uh, Madam Chair, I move to appoint Daniel Greenberg as a member of the Board of Registrars for a term to expire April 1st, 2024. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. And, and Mr. O'Leary, you obviously, as a please, obviously, uh, and again, recommend him. <laughs> as we all know, Mr. Greenberg, but also uh, the um, Democratic Town Committee is recommending Mr. Greenberg's uh, appointment after a couple of meetings, discussions, and uh, I think he'll be a, a great public servant on the Board of Registrars. Great, okay. Any further discussion? This is a roll call name vote. Mr. Walner. Uh, Mr. Greenberg. Mr. Studo. Mr. Greenberg. Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Greenberg. Mrs. Gonzalez. Mr. Greenberg. And Manu Pelli is Mr. Greenberg. Madam Clerk, anything else? I'm done. Great. <laughs> I appreciate okay. it. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's a good suggestion. I'll get to my All right. <laughs> Thank, Thank you all you. very much. I appreciate your consideration and um, your vote to at least amend the hours for the polling. I think that'll help and we'll take it from there. Great. Thank you. And good, good luck to the candidates that are on the board right now. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so we do have a couple of other uh, matters before the 7.30 public hearing. Do, do we wanna take up the rest of the appointments though while we're on to that topic? Sure. Mr. Studo? Yeah. Why don't we move, just clear up, clear up that one. We have a couple yep. more taxation and um, Madam Chair, I move to appoint the following individual to the Facilities Master Plan Committee for a term as noted. Rich McGowan, school representative, term till May 4, 2021. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Name. This is a roll call name vote. Mr. Walner. Rich McGowan. Mr. Studo. Rich McGowan. Mr. O'Leary. Rich McGowan. Mrs. Gonzalez. Rich McGowan. And Manu Pelli is Rich McGowan. Uh, Madam Chair, I move to appoint Richard Walner as a member of the Taxation Committee for a term to expire May 3rd, 2022. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? I think we need to interview the candidate. <laughs> Thank, uh, <laughs> Come down to Florida. You're welcome to talk to me. <laughs> well, good. <laughs> That's a nice invitation there. Yeah. All right. We, I don't think we need any further discussion on this one. This is a roll call name vote. Mr. Walner. We'll go for Mr. Walner. <laughs> Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Walner. Mr. Studo. Mr. Walner. Mrs. Gonzalez. Mr. Walner. And Manu Pelli is Mr. Walner. All right. And our next order of business was to vote to approve the useful life of capital items. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam Chair. That is correct. There are three items um, from the 2019 and 2020 capital improvement plans um, for which the committee's recommendation factored a longer useful life than um, the statute um, by default offers. And require and allows. Um, it's something that has frequently occurred when it comes to vehicles. We're in this case extending the useful life from five years to ten years, um, and I think in the case of many vehicles, we see them, you know, lasting at least that long. But the most important thing is that you know this vote is something that was um, predicate upon which the capital improvement plan was predicated in 2019 and 2020. Um, we have prepared a motion for the board to vote upon, um, and if there aren't any questions. Um, the board's action is simply to read and vote on the motion. Okay. Do we have a motion, Mr. Studo? Madam Chair, I move that the maximum useful life of the departmental equipment listed below to be financed with a portion of the proceeds of the borrowings authorized by the votes of the town described below is hereby determined pursuant to General Law Chapter 44, Section 71 to be as follows. Takeuchi Excavator, 110,000, 10 years. 
GVW dump truck, 200,000, 10 years, F-350 dump truck, 90,000, 10 years. I further certify that the votes were taken at an open meeting to the public, that no vote was taken by secret ballot, that a notice stating the place, date, time, and agenda for the meeting was filed with the town clerk and a copy thereof posted in a manner conspicuously visible to the public at all hours in or on the municipal building that the office of the town clerk is located or if applicable, applicable in accordance with an alternative method of notice prescribed or approved by the attorney general as set forth in 940 CMR 29.032B, at least 48 hours, not including Saturdays, Sundays, and legal holidays. Prior to the time of the meeting and remain so posted at the time of the meeting, then no deliberations or decisions in connection with the subject matter of this vote were taken in executive session. <clears throat> All in accordance with General uh, C30A, Section 18, the 25A, uh, as amended. That's it. Second. <laughs> Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. Walner. Uh, aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. And Manu Pelli is aye. Oh, and the, what a long-winded way to say you didn't use the town credit card in secret. <laughs> All right, and we have uh, one more item before the 730, which I think we'll make it to is the um, next order of business, approve the fiscal year 2022 employee health insurance. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, we have uh, been in um, some back and forth through our um, insurance broker um, at IBG, uh, Tony Mafio. Um, regarding our renewal with Blue Cross Blue Shield, and I'm pleased to report that um, you know, when combined with the performance of our PFA through Reimbursement Specialist Incorporated, the uh, premium increase percentage uh, was uh, limited to 5.5% this year over next year. Um, that rate of increase would actually allow us to maintain the, um, the amount of uh, surplus at the end of the year that we have been generating this year and the prior year, which is somewhere between 350 and $350,000 and $400,000, depending upon performance of the uh, year. Um, this was reviewed with the, um, the um, Insurance Advisory Committee, and at that point, we were forecasting it might be slightly larger than that, um, at about 6.5%, um, but it, uh, it ends up that we can, we can obtain the same performance um, by keeping the rate at about 5.5%. Um, you'll see at a later point in time, we can discuss the implications in the, the revenue and expense plan, but um, I, I think it's good news for us um, you know, in terms of the renewal and being able to provide our employees the stability of the same health insurance plan going into fiscal year 2022. Okay, any questions? All right, do we have a motion, Mr. Studo? Yes, Madam Chair, I move to approve the employee health insurance for FY 2022 as indicated in the attached summary. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. And Manu Pelli is aye. Okay. All right, so we have, we have two minutes to the public hearing. Mr. Gilberto, is there anything that we can cover in two minutes? <laughs> legal bills. All right, let's move to legal bills. Madam Chair, through you, there is a revised motion uh, through you to the clerk, uh, Mr. Studo. If you have not noted it, in the share file folder, there was a single motion that we needed to prepare is because the, uh, the total was not correct. So okay. if you go into the meeting folder, you should see um, a, a motion that says KP motion dash revision. Yeah, give me a second here. Sure. <clears throat> okay. Madam Chair, I move to approve legal bills for January 2021 in the amount of 10,055.93 as follows KMP PC 4888.43 general. KMP PC Labor 415350, 20 Elm Street 40B Project 1014 for a total of 10,055.93. Second. 
Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. And Manu Pelli is aye. All right, so this carries us to 7.30 to the public hearing. I am, due to a family member employed, uh, at the establishment, I am going to recuse myself and turn the chair over to Mrs. Gonz Gonzalez. So we will open the public hearing. <clears throat> the change of beneficial interest, apothecary, ales, brewery, and kitchen, formerly Dos Lobos. Good evening. John Connell, can you hear and Madam, see? Madam Vice Chair? Yes. Um, I'm just, I'm noting that it, it appears that everything made it into the packet except for the hearing notice. Um, I have it here and can read it if you, if you would like. That'd be great. Sorry, I apologize to the board about that, particularly to Mrs. Studo. Notice of public hearing in accordance with chapter 138 of the Massachusetts General Laws. A virtual public hearing will be held by the select board on Monday, April 12th, 2021 at 7.30 p.m. on the application of Hypothecary Ales Brewery and Kitchen, 303 Main Street for a change in beneficial interest. The hearing may be ac accessed through Zoom technology via the internet, via telephone, um, with a meeting ID of 827-857-80117, signed by the select board. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, and... Um, I believe we have someone here to speak for. There is, I believe there's an individual here on behalf of Hypothecary Ale. Good evening, John Connell. Can you hear and see me? We can. Yes. Oh, great. I believe also Steve Gabardi and James Dietz are on. Yes, I saw Mr. Dietz is here. Yes, uh, Jim Dietz is here. All right, thank you, good evening. The applicant is seeking to add one new member, which has 17 sub members, and that's it. We're not looking to change the operations of the restaurant or uh, change the manager of record or any of the officers. Okay. Um, do any of the members have any questions? Oh, Mr. Gilberto. Yep, Madam Chair, I, I, I can just tell the board that, you know, I think you're aware from a previous application to change the DBA back in December, January, that this was something that was forthcoming. Um, I believe Mr. Dietz indicated at that time that we should expect that that would be um, forthcoming. Um, and um, the application is here. We have reviewed it here in the office and, um, you know, find everything to be uh, in order. Um, as, as Attorney Connell indicated, there are a number of individuals as part of the entity, but uh, it appears all of their paperwork is, is in order. Um, there are you know, a couple of outstanding um, items that are being reviewed with the various inspectional departments, um, but I'm told that, you know, that that review is, is moving along and it should not impact disapproval. Okay, great. Um, any of the members have any questions or comments? Just what's the timeline look like here? How soon? Still uh, we're hoping for early June if everything kind of lines up and it's looking like that could happen. That's good. I think it's, I think you wish you much, much success. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Studo, Mr. Walner? No. Um, okay. And myself, I'd like to also welcome you and wish you all the best of luck. And I think it'll be a great addition and we look forward to it. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. Uh, Madam Chair, I move to approve a change of beneficial interest for the common ticket all alcohol license for Dos Lobos LLC DBA Hypothecary L's Brewery and Kitchen 303 Main Street. Second. Okay, I have a motion by Mr. Studo, a second by Mr. O'Leary. Um, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. And Mrs. Gonzalez is I. Um, Mrs. Manupelli is recused. So congratulations. Thank, Thank you very you. much. And Mrs. Manupelli, I will turn the meeting back over to you.
or not. <laughs> I didn't expect it to go that fast. <laughs> so why don't we move on to the, the next item, which is public comment. Is there anyone here for public comment? You can raise your hand um, for... I'm not seeing anybody, Madam Vice Chair. Yeah, I don't see anything. So no one here for public comment. We will close that and move on to the approval of trash recycling fee for FY 2022. Oh, is that Kate? No, Mark Clark. Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair. Yes. The chair is rejoining us. It's impossible that you finish that public hearing in four minutes. <laughs> I see the I see the pattern. I'm the one that asks all the questions during your public hearings. All right. Okay. What are Madam Chair? We did public comment, and we are, I think are on to the trash fee. All right, approve the trash recycling fee for FY 2022. And we have with us this evening. Who do we have with us this evening? Ma Madam Chair, I'll actually be presenting, it. although Mr. Clark is here on behalf of the DPW as well. Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Gilberto. Thank you. Through you to the members of the board and the community. Um, this is a follow up to a couple of conversations that occurred earlier this year with regard to. Um, the trash fee um, and um, the adjustments that would be required to be made to that trash fee in order to account for an increase in the cost, not only of the collection of trash and recycling here in North Reading, but also in the uh, rate for the disposal of trash at Covanta in, uh, in April. And so uh, we discussed a, a number of options um, at a meeting uh, roughly six weeks or so ago. And um, what we've tried to do is come up with a recommendation that shows a multi-year plan for what the fee would be at um, during the life of the agreement with, um, with JRM. And so based on the discussions, what we are recommending um, based on the current system, the current two barrel collection system with one bulk item per week and unlimited dual stream recycling that the fee would increase from $68 per quarter on July 1st to $75 per quarter. That would not fully cover the cost uh, of the increase in the first year. It would rely on some funding from the, um, the stabilization fund for solid waste. But we would then recommend another increase a year from then for fiscal year 2023, effective July 1st, 2022, to $80 per quarter, and that would align us with the, um, the, the actual annual cost. So it's a two year phasing in of um, increasing the fee. I think that we have the capacity to do that, but probably more importantly, we are able to generate, um, you know, to regenerate the stabilization fund over the life of the agreement if we continue to um, match the fee with the annual cost, which ends up being roughly a, you know, a $3 per year increase in fiscal year 2024, 25, and 26. And so you know, our, our hope is that we've been responsive to the feedback we heard from the board um, over the, uh, the, at the at the meeting roughly six weeks or so ago. Uh, I'm gonna stop there. Uh, I, I know there's some conversation um, that I would like to just bring up with regard to the system itself and some of the concerns that have been expressed in the community, but I'll, I'll hold those comments until you, you signal we're ready to talk about that. Sure, and, then, and also, Mr. Gilbert, there's a committee that's been researching and reviewing these issues on behalf of the town and comparing to what other communities are doing, considering what North Reading has done previously that didn't work and how this has evolved to what the current uh, fee is to this day. But um, I'll leave this for discussion for my colleagues, um, if anyone would like to comment or ask any questions. Mr. Walner? Um, well, I did have a chance to review this, and there was a letter that was sent in from a citizen, and he cited a lot of issues, you know, um, the abuse of the two-barrel limit, um, the fact that the school schools in some 
town uh, um, departments are are basically getting trash disposal um, at the cost to the residents. Um, I th I've had probably like the rest of you, I've had some calls about this feeling that there's unfairness. Um, so there's, you know, it's, I, I think that, you know, sorry, I'm first out, out of the gate here, but um, it, it, it sounds like, I mean, it sounds like the group did a good job of putting together a, an affordable package for the trash and the recycling. And I, I'm, so I'm pretty satisfied about that. Um, but I'm concerned about this residual um, complaints that we're getting from the town. And so that's been my biggest concern. And I don't want to stop progress from taking the steel because I think there's some time pressure to take the steel. But I also think that there should be a really active campaign if we haven't already done it to like address these issues that keep coming up around the trash. I haven't had this many calls except for this issue. Um, so I'm looking forward to some discussion from the board as well about this and also to kind of uh, fill me in like everybody else about where we are in potentially changing the system or, I mean, one of the biggest abuses I hear, just to be very clear, and it seems like an easy one to solve, but I know I've been hearing about it for years, it's supposed to be a two barrel limit. And, you know, I know that people are abusing that. And I know that we, we will remind JRM to hold the two barrel limit. They do it and then, you know, people change or whatever and it goes back to people are throwing out you know, way too much trash and they're using oversized barrels, the whole thing. So we have this continuing problem with that. And I think if there was some way to solve that, we'd solve many, many problems. But right now we haven't been able to get a hold of it. So I'm sorry, I'm just kind of brainstorming through this. But the more I read about this, the more I'm just concerned, what are we gonna do even after we get this deal in place? What are we gonna do to solve this long-term problem that seems to be coming up for the residents? That's my comment. Okay. Um, let's, how about if, let, I'm just gonna go to my colleagues first and then I can let Mr. Gilberto maybe address things or amongst us we can discuss the things that Mr. Walner has raised as well. But uh, Mr. O'Leary, any? Actually, Madam Chair, if I may make a suggestion, I mean, I'd like to hear again from the, you know, the, the group that studied it and the administration who's proposed this, uh, uh, this framework uh, for us to move forward to cover our cost. Mm -hmm. But again, I think part of the, the, the problem is um, not just the cost, but the perception of fairness, um, you know, can we, is there a way for us to, to address it? So I think, I think if we get a presentation up front that may answer some of the questions, maybe precipitate some a little more discussion, but that's okay. But at least give the administration's position on it. I think it would be helpful. Okay. Um, Mr. Studo, any comment or questions or? Um, no, I, I, I agree with uh, what Mr. O'Leary and Mr. Wallner said. And uh, I did speak to someone who actually was nice enough to give me a history that I can't, I mean, it would probably take a lot of time digging. And um, yeah, the question is, based on what I've seen also in other communities and the communities that do a hybrid system and communities that pay more than us and only get their trash picked up every two weeks, is there, is there in the year 2021 with the fact that no one wants to take our trash anymore, is there a better way you know, and also I think one thing to bring up is that going forward, I feel that the gradual increases should never be stopped just because we had a good year. Because, you know, when I look at things, a lot of issues with cost, not just trash, but other things is that a lot of towns do not index for inflation, not just North Reading. Um, while everything else goes up, it just no one talks about it. And I feel that sometimes, especially on the cost perspective of it, not the fairness of, you know, the two barrel that needs to get enforced differently. But I feel that a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of anxiety is the sticker shock when there's a huge increase all at once, because something that should have been increasing little by little, because it was a hard conversation to have. And then it becomes the, oh man, now we have to do it rather than, you know, it's got to go up every year, little by little. So that, that's the only thing I would have. Mrs. Gonzalez? Yeah, so um, I was part of that committee um, and we did a great deal of research. Um, myself and Mark Clark both um, 
did some comparisons with other towns. And what we came to was that we were getting a good deal. <laughs> we really were. And I mean, there are towns that I looked at privatizing, explored that. Um, thinking that if we had competition in town, that maybe that would lower the prices, but comparing that to towns that have privatized, it is not true. Not only do you have several trash trucks coming through all week long, um, they were charging more. There were people having their trash picked up every other week and paying more than we do every week. So, um, and Mark Clark did some research also in surrounding towns and the bottom line was we we were getting a good deal so um i tried to explain that to the several phone calls i also got <laughs> and i know we got letters i know it's upsetting i know nobody wants their prices to go up and and more upsetting is the people who take advantage and know that more trash will get taken if they put it out that's a policing issue um the problem is if they don't take it does somebody dump it somewhere you know and then our town gets trashy looking. So um, I would be happy to be part of that committee and to have a, um, an open meeting and, and have the public involved. I would be happy to do that if that's what we feel we should do. Okay, thank you. And uh, I, oh, Mr. Struda. And Madam Chair, just one last thing I wanted to add because the, uh, the phone call I had today actually was a really kind of made a good suggestion that also if um, when we're discussing solutions and you know the the TA might look at this that maybe education for new residences or new people that move into town that don't know that it's not unlimited I mean I know when I moved in four years ago I mean I've never had more than a barrel up but no one said you know you can't have x right you kind of just think oh, all right I pay quarterly I can put whatever I want so maybe a lot of the issue can just be solved with uh, you know welcome to North Reading when it comes to your trash, you know, you can't just put everything out there. There is a, a limit how much you can do a week. So I, I think that was a great suggestion that I got this morning by this resident. So I just wanted to state that. Mm. Right. I, I do recall when I moved here 19, 18, 19 years ago, we put too much out being a big family. And I do think we got a, a ticket. I don't think we had a fine, but it was more of a warning to us right away. And so we, we knew right away. Um, I don't know where the complaints are coming from for the abuse of the system. And I don't know what neighborhoods that's being observed in as an abuse of the system. I don't observe it myself, but I don't go around looking like at things like that. Quite frankly, and well, to be honest, I don't go around looking at at the trash to see what's happening with other people's trash. But um, the, the board does know that the amount of, of the, the fee that we take in isn't enough to pay for the program, uh, the service of collecting the trash. And that is because of all of the remarkable changes and we're not the only community that's going through this. And it is a topic that we've addressed, not just this year, but last year we were given ample warning that this was uh, gonna be significant changes and were significant changes. Um, so it's not a new topic. It's not a whimsical decision that is being made. And I would concur with Mr. Studo in, in that we have to keep with, we have to keep with the cost and not do market increases all of a sudden because we have been lax at paying attention to to this I and mean, we have a contract so we can at least plan for the length of the contract but what happened to impact this change wasn't foreseen not just by us but by any other community so we're trying to figure out a way to resolve it and to the only way that's come up so far is to increase it i think that my sympathy is for an individual like the individual who wrote us a letter who said, I'm not even there for, you know, a certain amount of the year. So the thought would be, how do we, you know, do a waiver for someone, someone, but then how, how is, how is the hauler going to figure out which houses, you know, they don't collect from and which houses they do. So the practical aspect of that would be 
would be tough to police just as much as someone putting an extra bag in their barrel for, for the hauler to take. So I don't think there's an easy one size fits all other than the one fee fits all. Um, but that's just my one, one out of five opinion. So Mr. Gilberto, I don't know if there's anything else you might wanna add to the discussion, especially with regard to the abuse or any complaints of abuse um, of the two, two barrel or overflow or has the hauler told us that that's become an issue across the town? Um, so no, the feedback that we, we've gotten from the hauler is, um, you know, the, the feedback that I think we discussed six weeks ago and then maybe even a few weeks before that, which is that, you know, the, the, the a more significant challenge has been the recycling and contaminated recycling. And, you know, there's been quite a bit of a focus on their part on, on that. And, you know, we, we have a proposal from them um, that uh, we're you know, working through contracting at this point that would not subject us to the fines that other communities have had with regard to that. And that was very important for us in, in proceeding with this plan. Um, you know, I can tell you that when we, you know, we began working on this, in, <coughs> excuse me, in the fall, you know, we were not necessarily, we were looking at whether the system itself worked and whether the value was there. And, um, you know, I, I think that we've identified that there are, that, you know, the system is not perfect, but that from a value standpoint, you know, it, it was, um, you know, something that we were all pretty comfortable recommending that we proceed with. And I think we even got to that point in a determination the board made going back that six or so weeks really became an issue of, okay, well, what's the fee going to look like and how are we going to manage that? So this item was on the agenda with a recommendation to address the fee under the current system that was in place. In the meantime, we've gotten some very important feedback from, from residents in, in a few different forum, forums, and so are the board members, you know, that there, there are these issues of maybe not uniform enforcement. And, um, you know, there's, you know, we've talked here and we have a, a, a two-pronged approach that we, we intend to pursue, which is first and foremost education for all of our residents as to what those restrictions are and pushing that education out, not only through the town's website, but through that through its social media presence as well. And we're hopeful that that alone will help, but we also have um, the ability um, and, and we'll speak with the hauler regarding the importance of that consistency in the, in the collections. And uh, we know that that can be disruptive and that some, for some families or for some residents you know, the, 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 um, the, the restrictions aren't understood until something is left at the curb. And, you know, we want to avoid that situation if we can, but we do know that sometimes that's what it takes. Um, and so our intention is to, to move in, in, in that two-pronged two approach to really try to, um, you know, educate people and ultimately require, you know, compliance with it um, by, working with the contractor so that somebody who's not in compliance does not see their their um, their curbside grass collected. Um, we're not going to push that message for tomorrow. Um, I don't know that that would be fair at this hour of the evening, um, but you know it is something that I think we'll look to do in the coming weeks um, so that folks you know better understand what the requirements are and that ultimately if we're not complying the trash won't be collected. Um, you know, as to some of the other models that have been discussed, there's been a lot of conversation about them. I know that the pay as you throw model is something that that folks have brought up um, stickers going on the bags, for example, and, and you know, uh, candidly, we've received quite a bit of feedback from people that when that program was initiated, there was a, a pretty strong sentiment that it was not the right fit for the community. And so we have not been advancing that that ought to be something we go back to. The secondary solution that's been discussed is the the you know the multi, you know the, the two tier system right the family versus the one or two resident system and the challenge with that is that it often involves the purchase of toters which is very expensive and not something that we were really looking to advance because of the cost at this point especially knowing that Covanta increase would be coming. Um, so I'll stop there just to kind of give that information, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Any other questions or comments? Just, just Mr. Walner. And anything on the, um, the report about, you know, the schools and the, and the departments getting kind of basically free trash pickup. Can you comment about that at all? Cause that's like a,
a budgetary type issue to me. But uh, again, can you just comment on that? Sure. I mean, I, I can't speak to how the program was initially set up and what, how it was supposed to run in terms of that back in 2000, I think early 2000s at this point. Um, I can tell you that I think what the history has been is we've set the fee at whatever the cost is in a particular fiscal year, not increase the fee. And effectively what has happened is the general fund, um, the, the, the tax rate, if you will, is absorb the difference. And um, so, you know, there, there hasn't been a match. We do not bill any department for trash collection um, services. So we don't send a bill to the school department. We don't send a bill to the enterprises um, for, uh, for payment of that. So what happens is as time goes on, there is a subsidy that's occurring in the form of the general fund. Um, that would not be the case under the funding schedule that I've identified here. It would keep the costs in line with the costs associated, <clears throat> excuse me, with the entire program, including the municipal and school uh, and enterprise buildings. Could you just address, Michael, to the, the, the comments that were made in relation to uh, some other than the other than, again, to me, you know, the school department, town hall, uh, parks and recreation, you know, the enterprises, we all, we all own that, you know, so to me, to me, it's not like we should be billing the school department for picking up their trash because all you're doing there is just a shell game of increasing their budget costs, reimbursing the DPW for whatever the cost is going to be. It's, it's just a shell game. To me, you know, these are the operations of the community, you know, whether it be the police, fire department, everybody else, everybody should be paying for that. And that's basically what's happening. Um, well, it's subsidized through the tax rate, even subsidized through the rates here. Um, either way, you know, town buildings and departments shouldn't be charged separately, you know, for, for this. But in relation to uh, comments that have been made, and again, I've been around for a while here and uh, had conversations with some of our residents and constituents over the last couple of weeks, um, I'm not aware of anybody that gets a cut rate on trash fees. Um, we've never had any discussion on it. We don't have a tiered rate system for it. Um, we have some residents of the community that live in uh, condominium complexes and, and other uh, plan unit developments that actually pay for their own trash and don't even uh, enjoy the benefit or have the option. We have some people who opt out of the program when they can prove that they have a private hauling uh, service, but they have to prove that. But nobody, that, to my knowledge, is getting subsidized in any other fashion. Yeah, Madam Chair, through you. Yes, Mr. So you know, the, the, the two tiers that are out there are, are residents who, single family residents who are charged for that service or those who are able to produce documentation that they are, um, that they have an alternative collection um, in place in a contract. Um, so, you know, they've got a hauler that's coming to their home at some reasonable interval to pick up trash and, um, and recycling. They provided us proof of that. And, um, and, and that is the instance where somebody is um, not, they're not required to pay the fee and they're not offered the, the collection service. Um, I, I see the water superintendent who also acts as the utility superintendent is on here, Mark. Um, you know, I, anything that I've missed in, in either the issue of the cost between, you know, departments and, and the issue of, you know, the, the, the discounting of, of it. I mean, my understanding is it's all or nothing, but I've, if I'm misunderstanding, certainly correct me. <laughs> Uh, so there is one additional group when the trash fees were adopted, if people qualified for a real estate exemption, they were given a 50% automatically get a 50% trash exemption. So people who qualify as maybe a disabled vet, there's a number of different things. Uh, so the assessor's office, people apply, I believe in January for their real estate exemptions. When they qualify, the assessor's office will send us a list and we'll abate off half their trash. So there are people that get a 50% trash exemption. And I, I, was that a fixed group mark going back to the transition or is it an annual annually reviewed? So they have to annually apply to the assessor's office. Uh, there's a form they fill out in January. The board of assessors meets, they look at the qualifications, see if the people in the the house still qualify for that, and then they grant them an exemption on their real estate. And because they get an exemption on their real estate, the rules we adopted automatically give them exemption on their 50% uh, of their trash. 
And Mr. Clark, through you, Madam Chair, did, with regard to the the cost being off off, you know, transferred around, has that occurred historically? Uh, not to my recollection. So I know the I I can speak for the water department. So the water enterprise I don't think has ever paid for trash collection. Um, police fire I don't think so. I, I would say certainly not police and fire. The only thing I'd have to go further back and look at would be the school department. But, but not, I know- Really not currently. Yeah, not in recent years that I can recall. Does any, I know this was studied, does any other community charge for the hauling of its school or municipal building trash? Did, did you look into that? I, I've never heard of such a thing that that would be parsed out and charged independently, but I didn't study it like the committee did, so. Yeah, I don't think, Mr. I'll say I don't, I don't know of any community that does that. And I believe as Mr. O'Leary referred to it as kind of a shell game, taking it from one pocket and putting it into the other pocket. Mrs. Gonzalez? Um, I believe in the privatized communities, you know, that the billing would be separate. The school would yeah. have their own bill, you know, because it's privatized. But that would still be a, a town or a, a municipality's incurred expense to, to cover. Correct. Right. Okay. So, so I am getting a text that the schools, if there's a special collection at the schools, as if they had to dispose of a, a used piano, they we do get billed for that and we will send the school the bill for that. Um, that's something I'm just learning right now. Okay, all right. Um, okay, well, I do think there's a vote. We do need to take a vote on this um, or, or table the vote, but I do know that this is going to factor into our budget discussion for sure. Um, so what's the pleasure of the board? Are we prepared to move forward with the recommended increase? Mr. Walner? I'm, I'm seeing that, are we going to take public comment at all? Because I see the hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you actually did do public comment. Uh, not on this issue, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you see, can you so, see Tony Lo, 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 Mr. Right? Gilbert, Mr. Greenberg, I did see you had, you just raised your hand. Yeah, I think Tony was in front of me. Excuse me? Tony, 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 Lerone. Lerone. Tony, Tony raised his hand first. You should hear from him first. Oh, I'm calling on you, Mr. Greenberg. Did you have anything to add to this discussion? Yes, I do. I have several comments. Okay. Um, as you, as the board knows, I'm on the recycling committee. And you may ask, uh, well, how does the recycling committee have jurisdiction over trash? Well, the simple answer is for every pound of solid waste that you move from the barrel to the recycling bin, the town saves money because they don't pay a tipping fee. So it has a very direct impact on the recycling program. Uh, two, there are a number of issues that are that are related but not necessarily linked. There's the contract with JRM. There's how do you add up the cost of solid waste disposal in the town and distribute it amongst its residents. Um, and there's the issue very related of enforcement that has been alluded to. Now, first, as of the contract with JRM, um, I'm very familiar with the work of the committee that negotiated with JRM. And as I have said at previous meetings, I think they did a more than terrific job. I don't think people wholly appreciate what a good deal they were able to strike with JRM. It still astounds me that they were able to get the deal that they got and I fully support it. <clears throat> so I, 
once you establish what the cost is between JRM and Covanta, it's a question of budgeting how you distribute that. Now, I'm very interested in that issue. And um, Tony has written a letter raising some very, very prescient issues that I think really bear important looking into an investigation by the town. I promise you that the recycling committee intends to address those issues at its next couple of meetings, the first of which will be next week. Um, the important thing I think that Tony raised is how do you how do you equitably share the cost of solid waste amongst the town residents? Um, and I know that it's become a dirty word. I'm just asking you to hold your fire on pay as you throw. It, it, it may be an important answer to that question. We need to look into it. It bears a lot of study. Um, I went on the uh, DEP website today. There is a wealth of material on the DEP website about pay as you throw. Um, I learned some new things. For example, that 43% of the towns in Massachusetts do pay as you throw. That in general, it tends to move around 30% of the, of the weight of solid waste from the trash barrel to the recycling bin. And you all know how hard I've worked for two years on dealing with cleaning up the contamination and that's a separate issue. Um, and the other thing is that the cost of the town goes down by an astounding percentage. So I want you to keep an open mind and pay as you throw. I think the motion before the board ought to be passed. I think the committee did a terrific job, but we have a lot of work to do about making the um, uh, removal of solid waste in North Reading to a more equitable kind of program where the people who use it the most pay the most and the people who use it the least pay the least. Those are my comments. Okay, um, our, our um, proposal that we're talking about isn't a pay as you throw proposal. I'm not, no, I'm not asking you, yeah, to, so the, I'm asking you to put that off. That bears much further study. I support the motion. Okay, I think, okay, so. I'm not asking you to change anything at this point. I just want time to study it and to make a, 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 an informed recommendation to the board. And I'm not prepared to do that. No, no, I wasn't. I, I was actually asking just in terms of the dialogue or the questions that were raised, if there was any input on on those items. No, it's just, it Tony pointed out there's a lot of there's a lot of unfairness in the present system. Okay. Is 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 Tony Mr. Mr. Loray? Loray? Mr. Larray, um, and just for those in attendance, this is not a public hearing. I think we would need to advertise that as a public hearing, but um, for purposes of recognizing the hand that's raised, and that's Mr. Larray. Did you have a question, Mr. Larray, or a comment? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Uh, Tony Larray, 21 Strawberry Lane. Um, the current system isn't working, and the numbers show that. So. If you, if you were around back in 2013, we actually went to a three barrel limit. And then in 2014, we went to a two barrel limit. So between FY13 and FY16, our total trash quantity went down by 12%. That's about 450 tons. Between FY17, actually, the, I'm sorry, these are calendar years, Calendar year 17 and 19, the trash has gone up 9%. Um, so clearly, we were enforcing the two barrel limit in the initial years and have gotten away from that. And that's basically added another $50,000 to our disposal costs. Um, and if Madam Chair would allow me, I'd like to share a few photos just to explain what's going on. And people may say, 
you know, they don't look at the trash, but if you're in the trash business, you do look at the trash and I look at the trash. So if that's okay, I, I'd like to uh, spend a minute and just show you what's going on. I don't, I don't know that that's appropriate. We haven't actually, we're not sure what you're, <laughs> we haven't seen what you want to display, but I would like to it's hear photo. from the committee. It's 10 photos. Um, and I would like, I would like to hear from the committee just in terms of addressing the cost increase and what that's related to. Um, if the committee, if oh, Mr. Greenberg can speak to that. I know what we were presented with information was um, the additional cost, the, the, the uh, reason for the increase were the additional costs associated with the recycling program and the lack of uh, you know, the refusal to accept recycling and the idling time that was caused by the trucks lining up and having to wait and the additional costs to the haulers associated with that, which then got passed along to the, the municipalities. But uh, that's really the type of thing that I would be looking to hear a little bit more from the committee on an explanation exactly what uh, Mr. Lohr explained and so that far the people in attendance can understand why the increase. Is it because people are putting three and four barrels out now and that there's more to be hauled away? Mr. Greenberg. Uh, a, a tremendous amount of the increase is because the commodity market for recycled goods has fallen through the floor for the past three years, primarily because of something called China Sword when China decided they weren't gonna take our contaminated recycling anymore. Uh, that's a substantial reason for it. Yes, I do recall that was a presentation to the board um, a while ago, actually, when we started to revisit this yes. issue. Um, and the, interesting thing about, the interesting thing about the JRM contract is that they're not imposing an additional cost for contamination of the recycling stream, which is unusual in the current contractual environment. I've talked to met, uh, many people at DEP and other towns, and they, this team was able to negotiate a great deal. There's no additional cost for that contamination. That's not a reason not to clean it up. You all know that I've been working to clean it up, but it's a tremendous advantage. This is a, that was a great contract. Price is good. Okay, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Studo, and then we'll, I did see your hand up, Mr. Gilberto. Mr. Studo. So I think, would it be appropriate to, we need to vote on this and get this going. I mean, that's not gonna change tonight. I mean, we're not gonna come up with an alternative. Okay, I mean, you know, we could sit here till two in the morning, we're not gonna do that. But I do think I agree with everyone who spoke that we should look at alternatives for you know, whatever the recommendations come. And then I also like to point out that kind of like some of the other issues we have with the not being able to export our contaminated waste for lack of a better way to put it, there are always gonna be outside factors that no one in town is going to be able to figure out or negotiate our way out because they are much bigger than North Reading or Massachusetts or the US. So I feel that we need to take that into account too, that, you know, I'd like to see a study, uh, I'd like to see as part of the study, that if we had 100% compliance with the two barrel, how much would our costs go up or down? Because if we had 100% compliance, but then you come back to me and say, JRM said, we're barely budging, then, then, then it's a whole other conversation that maybe the solution is not as simple as just making sure that people aren't putting their construction waste, which I disagree with on the lawn. So I think that's an important thing to know because again, um, you know, what's if I, I do agree with Mr. Greenberg that I think a lot of the cost increases coming that will come have very little to do with, you know, what's going on in North Reading. And I just, we need, we need to, what's the old saying like control what you can don't go crazy on things outside of your control and i feel like there's a lot outside of our control right now that 
is being discussed without someone just saying that there are certain things that we're never going to be able to control. So I just, I wanted to make that clear as my opinion. Right. I think, I think the previous contracts, I think it was, it was beneficial for JRM to enter these contracts and take away the recycling and they made money off of that previously. Now with the, you know, total switch, the 180, they're no longer, it's costing them money. So they've had to come around to every other city and town like ours and say, oh, we can't do it anymore. We have to, we have, now we're incurring the cost. So um, what, what, while that's going on, I agree, I do agree the committee's done a lot of work in investigating this, researching it, reviewing it, and what Mr. Greenberg says, I, I totally agree. They don't have to take it if it's contaminated, but we also don't get fined or additional fees associated with that. So that that's a must, I think. That was a must for our contract. Um, Mr. Mr. Gilberto, did you need did you want to say anything else on the issue? You're Thank muted, you. I think. Oh, there, okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Only that, you know, in addition to the pressure in the recycling market, our per ton rate for disposal with Covanta went up substantially or is going up substantially beginning July 1st of 2021, this July 1st. Um, that's something that is not unique to North Reading. Um, I believe it's going to $90 per ton for disposal. And Mr. Clark or Mr. Greenberg can correct me, but I believe we were somewhere in the high 70s right now. So it's not a small jump um, that we're being um, subjected to. And we are not the only folks who are being impacted by that. There is a number of communities in our region who have been impacted by that increase as well. So and that's something else that's driving it. As to the volume, it's variable um, you know, in terms of you know, what happens. I think if you looked in most communities, and this is not scientific, but I, I'm reasonably confident that if you looked in most communities over the past 14 months, there was an uptick in how much was being put curbside, purely um, a reflection of the amount of activity people have been conducting in their own homes um, over that period of time. But I, I do think that you know the Department of Public Works you know has recognized and has been working on um, ways to remind folks of what those um, restrictions are on the program. And that we can also work with JRM to really push that that they are, are seeing those restrictions through at the curbside collection, you know, here in town as well. Um, and and, and that, that that certainly could um, drive the cost down from what the projections are. And we can evaluate what to do based on that performance when we get to that point in time. But um, you know, the biggest single driver right now for us going into next year is that rate going up. Okay. Um, any other discussion? Mr. O'Leary? Just, you know, I, I think in relation to the proposal that's before us tonight, I think that's something that we need to act on. I think it's a, um, a reasonable approach at this point to uh, meet the terms and conditions of the contract that we've entered into and the rising costs associated with the with trash disposal. But I also think it's important for us to, again, and we need to do it periodically, is, is revisit you know, how we're operating here. And I think the pay as you throw is something that, that should be looked at and considered. And, um, you know, the administration should put together some sort of a, a group of people again to, to, to look at it hard and, you know, what is, uh, I mean, if what Mr. Greenberg says is true, and I have no reason to doubt it, that 43% of the communities in, in the Commonwealth have a pay as you throw program. We're not reinventing the wheel here, you know, and we should be able to take the best practices of uh, those communities and see how does it fit for us? Does it work or doesn't it? And if it doesn't, the public needs to understand, I need to understand, but the public needs to understand why we're not looking at that option seriously because, um, because there are inequities, obviously, in the way that the system is, is designed right now. You know, with the person who puts the one barrel out once a week or once every two weeks, even in some cases, and then we've got the disparity in the size of containers that are being utilized by people all across the community. There's no uniform, uh, I mean, I see people in my own neighborhood with you know, huge barrels, the ones that are used for the, uh, those communities that have the trucks with the cloth. I mean, uh, how those fit into our community as, as a barrel, and first of all, I don't know how the trash guys pick them up because they're about 80 pounds empty, never mind full, um, is that it's not the same as a 32 gallon barrel, it's a normal barrel, you know? So uh, I think we need to get some consistency in the enforcement. Um, seek the assistance of GRM in doing so, and whether we print some stickers for them to put on the top of the barrels and say, not next week or not next time, you know, or 
Again, we have to do a better job of educating the public in relation to really what is the size of the appropriate barrel and there needs some consistency. And, um, and I think people would feel better as far as a fairness issue if everybody were playing by the same rules. And uh, the public just needs to be reminded once in a while as to what those rules are. And I think it's incumbent upon us to do that. So, uh, but I think we should seriously consider taking a look at the pay as you throw. Uh, again, it's not a solution for this year or probably not even next year, but um, we need to take a look at it, see what other programs are out there. Mr. Mr. I know Mr. Walney, you had your hand up, but I, I just, Mr. Lohr, will you already, if I, Mr. Lohr wants to comment somewhere? Okay, Mr. Lohr, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to make a comment on, you know, what I've, just, what I've termed townwide obligations. So these are the municipal properties, and I, I don't think anybody is suggesting that you need to bill each and every department. I think what I'm saying is that's, that should be borne by all taxpayers, commercial, residential, et cetera. So it should come out of the general fund. Um, and there are other things like the 50% discount. I'm not saying that they're not legitimate, but what I'm saying, that should be a town-wide general fund obligation. It shouldn't be put on the backs of just people that pay the trash fee. Hazardous waste collection, open to all residents whether you're in a condo, an apartment building, or in a single family house. Again, town-wide general fund obligation. Uh, DPW staff cost to staff those special waste collections in the yard waste. Some of that, you know, those services are available to all residents. Again, it, it, it shouldn't be something that's borne by a subset of, uh, of residences. Um, and that's a whole host of other things. So by my estimate, there's 150 to $200,000 that probably should come out of the general fund off the top, and then you calculate the user fee. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lohr. Mr. Walner. Yeah, I'll just, uh, you know, I, I'm going back to Mr. Greenberg's comments. I agree with your comments. We do have to decide on this. This contract, it's, it's a good contract. I think the pricing is right. But I would hope, Mr. Lorray, you would join the Recycle Committee because you seem to have a very good handle on what's going on. And it would be good if you could join and, you know, help. I, I would feel better knowing if you were involved in actually helping to pursue recommendations that you feel and that the committee feels are more equitable for all. Because I do think there is a fairness issue. I don't think it'll ever be entirely fair. But I think we could do a better job of it. And I think your letter that you've sent to us did a good job of articulating where those issues are and since you're articulate about it would be if there's room it'd be good if you could join with this group and we could all go up to our pursuing that like Steve O'Leary said you know it'll probably take a year or two to come up with the right recommendations but it'd be a good long-term plan and we could build in fairness which I think everybody in in uh, North Friday would appreciate. Um. Mr. Walner, I was on the committee, recycling committee from 1990 to 2004. And I left that committee um, when the board switched to the flat fee. And we were not consulted. Well, I hope that, you know, it's 2021 and things don't always go the way we hope they go, but we're in 2021 right now. You seem to be passionate about it. Obviously, you got to sign up for what you want to sign up for. But um, it's people who care about this, study it, who understand it, mm -hmm. change. And there's been enough residents who are concerned about this, where I think mm -hmm. people applaud your participation and efforts, even if it didn't go well back in 2004. I can't speak for that, but I can speak for now. Yeah, we weren't some. We weren't, but we do. We do. We do listen to our committees, and the committees have done come and presented to us uh, their findings, their studies, their research. And that's really important to informing our decision as a board. So I would concur with Mr. Wall and we're trying to rope you in to get back on that committee, but we'll thank you for your participation. Mrs. Gonzalez, I'm gonna give you the last word on this because we do have to move forward. Yeah. <laughs> I'd just like to piggyback on that, that I am the liaison to the recycling committee and I think Mr. Greenberg um, will speak for the fact that I try to be very transparent and um, go back and forth, you know, and keep 
them up to date and they keep me up to date. And, you know, I don't feel that that should be a reason for you not to be on there anymore. We'd welcome you back. Okay. All right, Mr. O'Leary, you get the last word. I, I don't, I'm not looking for the last word, but I, you know, I think I think Tony's raised some very legitimate points. And if you recall a few few meetings back, I suggested putting more of the um, trash costs back into the general operating budget. And I know that it, in doing so, it it, uh, it impacts other areas in the budget. But that being said, uh, when we spoke earlier about it being sort of a shell game, you know. We should be paying for, you know, we shouldn't be charging the school department, we should be charging town hall recreation or the enterprises, you know, separate trash bills. But those costs, uh, and Tony's absolutely right, those costs should, costs should be borne by the entire community, not just those that are subject to a user fee. And uh, I, I think that's an important point that we should be looking at and uh, analyzing and, and putting it back in because it's, it's absolutely true that those that are participating and paying is user fee now um, are bearing the costs of, and that's not the entire community. So, I, you know, I think, uh, I think it's a legitimate point and something that we should be looking at from a budgetary standpoint and uh, at least know what the figures are and uh, see what we want to do, see how we can address it. And again, maybe it's something we need to phase back into the budget rather than, you know, one belt swoop and do it all at once. But I, I think it's a legitimate point and I think it's a question of fairness in relation to everybody sharing the cost of supporting um, the entire municipal government, so. Okay, thank you. Now, I'll just add to that though. I, I think we need the facts of what is, what it, the user fee is, is, in, is to pay the contract for JRM. That's what it pays for. I, I, we would need the facts to know the, the town-wide, you know, waste collection done by the DPW, is any of that taken care of by JRM? Is any of that part of their services or is that our DPW that's doing that? I think we need to do the list and do the research on that. But in terms of our vote this evening on the increase in the fee, I think we need to cover the cost of the hauling service that the committee's looked into. And I think that's what we need to take up. and. Vote the way, vote the way you will on that. Ask that matter, but that's what we need to take up this evening, and then we should really do ask the committee to look into um, and get in more information from the town on what these other costs are and how they're borne by the town. So I think the administrator has some answers to some of the questions already in relation to the dollar amounts associated, you know, with the cost for picking up at the schools and picking up a town hall and those those sorts of the. That's without looking at the, the town-wide recycling programs and hazardous waste pickup. But, you know, I think as a board, and, and again, I, I intend on supporting what's being proposed here this evening because again, I don't think this is a solution that's gonna take place overnight. Um, so you know, I intend on supporting the motion that's gonna be put forth, but I think it's important for us in the short term to take a look at some of these costs and see if they can be shifted appropriately. Okay, all right. I don't know, Mr. Gilbert, you don't have anything more to add to the discussion, do you? You're all set. I don't. Did other I, than did I notice your hand up, or was I, am I seeing things now? I don't think you. I think I spoke twice, and I, I think my hand was up okay. twice. But I don't think uh, I was in the queue, but I, I will just say that you know we certainly can can look at you know the the, the things that, that have been brought up in the discussion here, mm -hmm. and and how you know with the financial planning team how we might adjust things in the overall financial plan for the town to, to reflect that. And um, this is a fee that you know I think we've committed to look at annually. And if we're able to kind of dig in and determine these adjustments that could be made, we have the ability to do that at, at any point in time, including one year from now. Yes. All right. Thank you. Okay. Do we have a motion, Mr. Studo? Madam Chair, I move to approve trash and recycling fees for FY 2022 at $75 quarterly. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Manu Pelli is I. Uh, okay, we thank you. Thank you, Mr. Greenberg and Mr. Lore for Mr. Lore 
for coming and participate in the discussion. And um, it's not a, the issue is not done yet. We have a lot of work to do on it. I think a lot of research to do on it. So we'll move on to the next order of business. which is to review the updated fiscal year 2022 revenue and expense plan. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will be presenting the update this evening. Um, the, what I'll do if, if it's okay is I'd like to share my screen and I'll work off of the, the spreadsheet that's in your meeting packet. Okay. I'm going to have to stop for a second and hold on and then move this over. Okay, can everybody see a spreadsheet with the word uh, revenue at the top of it? Yes. Highlighted in green? Yes. So just by way of the updates, and this is uh, a uh, revenue and expense plan that was reviewed at the financial planning <clears throat> meeting last Tuesday. Um, I will just note that we are um, in the updates. First, you'll see we have added fiscal year 2023 and 24, um, two additional years into the projection. And the finance director and I attempted to project some of these costs based on um, what we know about the trends um, and what the history has been, you know, it's not an exact science, but um, we're trying to do our best to project for the members of the financial planning team, you know, where we think we may be headed in terms of um, available revenue and fixed costs. So the addition of these two columns is the first change. And uh, I'm not going to go over those two columns in detail at this point in time. I will highlight a couple of things that are relative to fiscal year 2022. One is that, you know, we've, we've um, we're watching very closely the motor vehicle excise number, and you know it's been certainly very busy over the past year, but there are some indications that that activity is slowing down a bit as well. So we're going to have to keep an eye on that number, you know, for this year, uh, but also for um, for the upcoming fiscal years. The next item I wanted to flag was the uh, payment in lieu of taxes, which we have. Um, we have it in there at $300,000. There was some discussion amongst the financial planning team about raising that projection um, as well. It's not reflected here, but we are going to be uh, increasing no, that based upon the, uh, based because, upon you the know what? Did print all the revenue and expense registration, yeah. which is fine, but it printed people who are on the wait list and everything else. I think I've muted the individual. <laughs> you should mute people. Did you um, mute? Did you mute anyone in attendance? I, I did. Yes. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Um, it sounds like our assessor, though. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so just um, you know, going through it, um, you know, we updated the license and permit number to reflect the increase in activity that we've seen over the past um, year, and I think we're all familiar with the work people are doing on their homes at this point in time, as well as some ongoing construction, um, as well. Um, the investment income, we're still holding at that, what I'll call the so-called reduced number at $50,000. You'll recall, some board members will recall we had increased that substantially, and then we're working to reduce that number. You know, I, I think that there's still been some conversation, and again, I, I unfortunately was required to leave the financial planning team meeting somewhat urgently last Tuesday when, we, um, when the water had to be shut off here to the town hall. So I was not part of that conversation. I don't want to attempt to summarize it because I, I, I don't have the firsthand knowledge, but I know that was another area that there was a lot of discussion about, um, and there has been over the past few years. If you just in relation to the payment in lieu, yes. you're looking for a hundred thousand dollar increase, and where is that coming from? Yeah, so I believe that the it, it's based upon the. It, I, I know that we we increased it based upon the trend that we've seen. You know, we've seen when we look at what's been coming in, it's been at that dollar amount, and I think it's actually higher than that. And so I believe the discussion, and I know I think Mr. McGowan is on here. He may know Ms. Hurlbut as well. I believe the, the recommendation for financial planning was to increase it from 300 to 325. This is the payment in lieu. So this is to, to more, more accurately reflect what the actual collections are. That's my understanding, yes. Okay, it's not as though we have another source of revenue or 
so what we do, and it, but the source is not new. The, 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 the increase goes back a couple of years with the uh, battery um, um, storage. Um, RMLD. The, the RMLD project, yes, right. down at the DPW yard. Okay. So yeah. there was a payment in Google taxes agreement. That number has increased. We've now object, we've updated that projection to reflect it. The conversation the financial planning team had was whether it could be updated slightly more to reflect the trend. And I thought it was to the tune of another $25,000. Uh, that was what the RMLD payment was, right? 20, 20 or 25,000. Uh, it may have been slightly more than that, Madam Chair. Um, I'd have to, I, I don't have that file in front of me at the moment, but um, you know, there was an increase and this board is obviously well aware of because it was involved in the actions and with town meeting in getting that increase in place. So we've updated the, the projection to reflect that. But that's a that's a hundred thousand dollar difference. Yeah. So there, and again, I, I don't I don't have that the detail of it in front of me. But there are, are have been other recurring payments in lieu of taxes as well that have contributed oh. to the number being adjusted. Yeah, that's my understanding. Oh. Okay. And whether it's you know the just increasing the projection rather than adding you know a new payment, um, this adjusted number um, got us pretty close to to where we believe the trend was at. Just, Peter, might, no. just in relation to uh, the, I don't know if the contract has been let or not in relation to um, the solar panels for the roof of the schools, uh, where does that get reflected in the budget projections, even though they're allocated to the school, you know, based on town meeting action, are they in the figures anywhere and when is that going to take place? Um, I, I, so I can't speak to, you know, the, exactly the timing with regard to the schools, but my understanding is that that would be a you know reflected as a school revenue in the overall school operating plan i'm not sure that it would show up on here similar to grants or other sources that they have that go to right. the school department that's so it would show up in their budget their, their revenue that's statement. my understanding yes okay um just moving through here there were no changes in the other financing sources other than to say we these grayed out categories have actually been moved to a lower area, two pages down where the municipal revenues are. Um, and you see them um, right here. So we'll, we'll be, to save space and trees, we'll be uh, hiding those, um, those rows. Um, you know, we're aware that this federal funding that's out there in the form of um, the American Rescue Plan Act um, we are not forecasting the use of any funds from that, but there is a substantial amount of funding that is um, earmarked for the town of North Reading. And, you know, um, there are defined uses for which we are, um, we are expecting to see uh, guidance from the Treasury Department in the coming weeks um, and to better understand how those utilization, how that utilization might um, relate to this budget. There are some updated numbers with regard to the, um, our assessment for regional schools and for debt service non-exempt. Uh, I will note um, late breaking um, after the financial planning team meeting. And in fact, in a letter that came in on Friday, um, we did get some initial notification from Northeast um, Metro Volk Tech regarding their proposed school building authority project. So um, we need to better understand exactly you know, what their timing is, but they are, you know, they're at a, a stage now where they're looking to advance that project forward. And we're expecting that um, we will be formally asked to consider our, our portion of that. Um, that's a very, like I said, very late breaking, not something that has even been discussed further at the financial planning team because we were notified on Friday um, with regard to that. Um, so there'll be more discussion of that and we'll look to see how that factors into our discussions here. We've adjusted the debt service number, but we are also going to be doing some um, um, long-term borrowing um, in the uh, coming weeks for some previously approved projects. So that number may need to be further adjusted. The snow and ice deficit, um, we end, we're, we're projecting we're gonna end somewhere around $325,000 um, for uh, the projection. Um, that we don't have all of our final bills in for that. And if we exceed that, you know, we'll look probably to free cash as a funding source to try to balance it. We did see an increase in municipal and school general liability insurance um, to the tune of 9%, um, which uh, drove these numbers up. 
but we are going to be working just to better understand um, exactly how um, how that um, you know where that number came from. You know, truthfully, I had been expecting we would see an increase based on a reevaluation of our municipal buildings, but that was a couple of years ago. So, but we're still trying to get to the bottom of where that projection came from. And then you see here we have the uh, municipal health insurance and the school health insurance highlighted. Um, you know, the board voted a 5.5% premium increase for the active employees. Right now, the budgeted number is uh, roughly 6.5% increase, uh, but it also includes the Medicare plans. Um, so um, you know, we've seen a little bit of uh, savings on that from the budgeted number of 7.5% where we started the year. Um, so that is something that is working favorably for, for us. And then scrolling through, we get to the uh, so-called allocation, and that is uh, utilizing percentages that we used um, last fiscal year. And I, I think kind of where, where we stand to this evening is that there is a projected um, um, deficit of $431,000 for the municipal operations and uh, roughly $494,000 for school department operations. The um, adjustment in the trash fee will um, help address some of this um, shortfall because we had not increased that trash fee number. Um, and I know that the school committee was participating in a budget workshop um, today and will be continuing their review of their budgets. Um, the finance director and I anticipate recommending um, steps to balance the municipal budget um, at the select boards meeting two weeks from this evening. Um, and the final thing that I'll note is, you know, we are looking and expect to look within both budgets, municipal and school, for any one-time items that might be small capital or otherwise in nature, which could be funded using uh, one-time source, such as uh, what we expect to be available free cash to alleviate some of the pressure uh, when we get to June town meeting. So there is quite a bit of work to be done, but we have made uh, a good amount of progress. The last time you saw this, uh, numbers in red for fiscal year 2022 were somewhere around $800,000 for school and $800,000 plus for municipal operations. So um, you know, we're making progress, but there is still some work to do and we hope to be you know, um, balanced or close there to come the April 26th meeting. And um, that, that's the update we wanted to provide. I, I was hoping, you know, sort of to keep it straightforward for the board um, at this point, um, but there'll be a bit more detail with regard to the municipal operating budgets, which you reviewed over the past six weeks, again, two weeks from tonight. Okay, just to uh, wanna see if my colleagues have any questions, Mr. Gilberto, or recommendations on, you know, getting that red number into black. So let's, let's uh, just turn it over to them, Mr. Walner. Uh, no questions, thank you. Mr. O'Leary. Just in relation to the uh, federal funding sources that are here, um, that are available and listed as zeros, um, what has the uh, discussion been at the financial planning team level in, in recommendations from the administration at this point? Uh, first of all, you know, what's the dollar amount? And again, you know, my concern is, is that we don't use these funds to uh, offset general operating expenses if we can't carry them forward um, in future years. Because again, while this may be available for a year or two for us, um, and it's a sense of funding, it, it would be tragic if we, if we didn't appropriate the money uh, for, um, it would appear as though under the guidelines that we've seen so far, we can offset some of our salary and other costs that we've incurred because of the pandemic that we have in our general operating budget and then repay ourselves, which to me would increase our free cash the following year. Um, but again, it's not recurring revenue. What What is the discussion been, and Madam Chair, maybe it's to you since you chair the financial planning team. Um, what's the discussion been and what's the philosophy at this point in relation to the use of those funds? Um, I can answer, Mr. Gilberto, you can add, but there really hasn't been any guidance other than the vagary of the, of the regulation itself yet. And so I think mostly we're waiting, we're waiting for guidance on its use and then to sort out a direction on it. Mr. Gilberto, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Um, no, that's accurate. Um, you know, we put the line um, that I highlighted in there. 
um, purely because one of the uses is revenue replacement, you know, and it's unclear to the extent that might even be a case or an impact for us um, in the coming years. But, um, you know, we really need that, that Treasury Department guidance to better understand. It certainly would seem to be a little more general, less restricted than the previous infusion of funds. Um, but, and perhaps thinking along Mr. O'Leary's lines that capital, maybe some of the capital acquisitions or the capital projects certainly would come under the umbrella of what the, you know, it's permissible uses. Mm -hmm. uh, water sewer is one of the things that was listed there. Um, infrastructure things that, that maybe perhaps instead of our, you know, designation of funds to capital, we could plug in because those are one time, Correct. right? You know, one time, mostly one time other than the roadway work, but it would certainly seem to be applicable in that aspect for, for some of those acquisitions that we would not have to use what we typically designate for capital improvements. But, but then you, you know, we're going back to that same issue, Mr. O'Leary, which you've mentioned just even with the income investment funding that we don't wanna plug it in here this one time and then not be not be prepared next year with the regular appropriate appropriation that's required. So I would say one time things, but the guidance just hasn't come out yet. And and if you don't use it, it goes back to the treasury. So we want to make use of every last dollar that we have, however we can. So I don't know if there's anything more, Mr. Gilberto, that you've heard in terms of the guidance or when, when that can be expected? I, I've been told it could be as late as the first or second week of May. So um, I'm hopeful it'll be sooner than that. But. Okay. And to, I just want to see if any of my, oh, Mrs. Hurlbut has a hand up, but let me just go to my colleagues and see if anyone else has any question, any other questions. Mr. Studo? I can't see. Um, Mr. Studo, Mrs. Gonzalez, any questions? No, I'm all set, thank you. Um, I just wanna point out, Mr. Gilberto, I received my excise tax from Reading and I, um, it was abated right away because I was told that the registry, because it looks like there's, your amount is lower. Our amount this year is lower than what we would, would have predicted collecting. But I was told from the assessor in Reading that the registry made a huge as it was a huge glitch at the at the registry. So I can't imagine I was the only one that got my bill from, from, from Reading. I was also told that I had to call the registry the number and alert them, which I did. And I waited on hold for an hour. I did other things while I was on hold. And when someone picked up, they hung up. So I haven't called them back yet just because I figured I'd give them an hour and that'd be enough of my time Don't donated to that. So um, I still haven't got my excise tax bill from North Reading, but I can't imagine I'm, I'm alone in that. So um, that's something that maybe can explain such a significant significant shortfall besides just maybe people are behind and paying, paying the bill. Um, but um, Mrs. Hurlbut has her hand up here. So from the finance team. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, to a degree at the finance team and also in the finance committee, the, the general sense concerning um, the uh, newfound money is that it's a one-time pop as, as everyone knows. The MMA had a very a very brief article about the kinds of things the town should really look at uh, as as a use once the guidelines come in. One of the ideas that the MMA suggested was that it get used as seed money, for a project that has um, uh, partial funding by another source such as the state. For example, the uh, Park Street Bridge. So that's a long term project that's going to be around for a long time. And um, if we were to get the state funding for part of it, we would have to come up with the additional funding. And that might be the kind of thing that some of this money should be used for. And about your size tax bill, Kate, I got mine about two weeks ago. I've already paid it. So you might want to check where it is. <laughs> in February. Um, 
the um but i think we feel the, very the issue with the with the funding is it looks like in at least in the regulations there's a first infusion to the town in six months and then another infusion in 12 months so all of these things have to be tied up and ready to go within a very short period of time, unless there's a modification to the legislation that extends it. So perhaps they'll do that again. I think the overriding point was that this is money that should be used for uh, long lasting mm -hmm. time things as opposed to reoccurring expenses. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thank you, Mrs. Hurl, but any other questions from my colleagues? Okay, so we look forward to um, some further review and more information. Hopefully by our next meeting, we'll have more, uh, a better understanding. Maybe, that, maybe there'll be more in terms of guidance that comes out that we can talk to the board about. Okay, next, our next order of business is to review the draft warrant in the June 2021 annual town meeting. And thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Mr. Gilberto. Um, so Madam Chair, my, my thinking was for this evening that we would focus on the articles that are non-financial in nature. Um, we do have, um, I know um, the town planner here and there is uh, some articles for which uh, the language was not available during the last meeting. Um, that are not customary articles. So um, if it's okay, I will share my screen. Yes, good. And go from, the, from that document. Thank you, that's great. And again, this is uh, the article for uh, the warrant for the spring annual town meeting, which will be Saturday morning, June 5th at nine o'clock a.m. We're identifying a location as 189 Park Street, but as we have discussed, our intention is to hold, hold it on the turf field at that property um, outdoors. So I am going to, um, if you will, skip ahead um, to uh, through the routine articles that we normally take up. Um, and I will just flag this uh, establishing the uh, cell tower receipt reserve fund, which is something that was recommended um, by the State Department of Revenue, um, but we are working through that um, with town council as to whether it, it will actually be necessary or not. Just, uh, just, just in, in relation to that, Madam Chair, the, so that was just, we didn't discuss that earlier, correct? You mean uh, vote, vote on that earlier? Yeah, I, I don't know, maybe it didn't resonate with me. Um, this was just put in for this meeting, first time? It, it was on the list of articles when we went through it in um, four weeks ago. And I did mention that it was something that was flagged by the Department of Revenue to be looked at. Okay. Um, but we're, honestly, a number of us are a bit puzzled because it's not new. <laughs> it's been around going back to 2011 or, or, or 10, I believe. So you know, we just need to resolve whether the action is actually going to be required or not. Yeah, and again, when, when we first get into the cell tower business here, and leasing space and getting revenue, you know, there was a lot of discussion around, you know, again, with the changing of technology, we don't know if this is going to be a recurring source of income either. Mm -hmm. um, you know, should it go into the general operating budget or should it go towards special projects? And initially, we were talking about reserving those funds for sidewalk <laughs> expansion and maintenance at the time was $110,000 a year. And uh, you know to expand sidewalks around town and to maintain those sidewalks. And again, if it were to dry up, um, then again, it wouldn't be necessarily the general operating budget that would take the hit. So I would uh, suggest that maybe if we're going to need to vote on something like this, maybe we want it to be specific to other types of projects rather than general operating expenses. Mr. Something that we certainly could consider, but you know, I, I can tell you that it, it has annually been a general fund revenue in the budget, and it, you know, there will there will be there certainly would be an impact that we would need to, you know, to consider. And again, um, are we? And maybe you should talk about it on the last slide. Are we anticipating a decrease in this revenue source? You know, as technology changes. It, it, that certainly is a possibility as the providers look at. Um, 
you know, at the uh, different options uh, to provide the service, either telephone pay based or otherwise. Um, you know, we've not we've not been we've not seen that in the payments. Um, we had one that uh, that terminated their lease early uh, in 2015, and um, I think at the time we were sort of concerned it would be a trend. Um, it didn't materialize in that fashion, um, but you know, it's something we could talk with Reading Municipal Light about to see what they're hearing from the utilities and know what the level of interest might be. And Mr. Gilberto, on this one, it doesn't have to do with the cell towers. It has to do with that, um, the reserve fund to offset the cost of um, special education. So I don't know why this is sewed up with cell towers. Uh, there, there's a separate article relative to special education, I believe a little bit later on. So 4013E has to do with that reserve fund for, um, reserve fund for, maybe this is just a mistake in the warrant then because we already did that. We already did that for the school committee at the last town meeting. We did create that reserve fund to offset unanticipated, the act not to put money in, but for unanticipated funds. So what the, they ended up with at the end of the budget, they could put into this reserve fund to use for, you know, extraordinary um, special education costs, tuition, things like that. So I I'll think- I'll the citation, Madam Chair. It may be that it's got the wrong statute it's citing. So what, what was flagged by DOR for cell tower? That's I'm not understanding that. Either. During our tax rate recap in the fall, um, they asked whether there had been, um, whether the, there had been, they actually asked whether there had been legislative approval establishing a vehicle through which cell tower receipts uh, would flow um, into uh, appropriation in the operating budget. And um, that's what prompted us to try to figure out exactly what we need to do the site, there is a there is a separate special education fund which you identify which we did establish a year ago and uh, I think the school committee is advocating for money to be transferred into that fund in another warrant article. But for this, the cell tower funds to be no no for the yeah. special education. But cell tower funds, if there's no specific fund designated as a reserve, would just come into the general fund as they are and be used for in you know. That, that doesn't make a lot of sense that there would need to be a reserve fund set up for it. I, I'm with you, I, I, I agree. I mean, it, it was, you know, a revenue stream on town owned property was being treated as a town, town revenue. Um, but like I said, we're trying to, to work through, you know, whether this is actually required because this is, I think 10 or 11 years we've gone through here and we're, we were surprised that this was flagged. Right, right. I think if it was to be for a designated purpose, then that might be something. Well, we need to look a little bit more into that. There, um, there will be more to come on that for sure. I think as cited, I don't think it's correct as cited though. I, I will check on that um, in terms of the language. Mm. The, the next article was an article that was uh, discussed during um, during the review of the warrant on um, the last select board meeting four weeks ago with regard to um, the compensation of elected officials. Um, you know, I note here that it was discussed on, on March 15th, but the, certainly you know, not finalized what would happen. And we've looked into this matter since that meeting and identified that it would um, en encompass a change to the uh, to the town's charter um, relative to um, being able to compensate boards and then there obviously would need to be a discussion about what the compensation would be. Um, I know there were some questions regarding um, eligibility for benefits and for um, uh, for eligibility for credible service for uh, retirement purposes. I, I can speak to that if the board members wish to hear about that or I didn't know whether the board wanted to discuss the language further. I, I know during the discussion, we were not considering a, a potential change to the charter and you know, um, candidly, that was not something I was aware of uh, when the article was brought up, but I've since obviously um, learned um, as I've researched the, 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 uh, the steps that would be required. So this is drafted as a, 
change in the charter that would also have an accompanying petition to the legislature to approve um, an amendment. Okay. Does, do the members have any question about this? I know I do, but. Uh, I do, uh, Chair Kate. I can't really see all of you, so let me just. You want me to stop the screen Michael, here, Madam Chair? But Mr. Studo, oh, thank you, Mr. Studo. Well, if we could, could you theoretically, you know, after we hear a little bit more, could you, could you approve this as like the ability to do it, and then at another town meeting actually recommend, if any, at that point, compensation, or does it have to be like a one-two punch now? Just maybe that's like a technical question. Madam Chair. Uh Yes, Mr. Gilberto. So to that point, you know, we, we in our research we identified that uh, I think roughly twelve or so years ago, um, our warrant article language appeared um, to um, to address that issue, and, and that language at that time was addressed as that members shall be compensated. We've modified the language in the draft to say that they may be compensated, so it would not be you know binding on the community. Um, you know, the appropriation of funds is something that needs to happen annually at town meetings. So if the board was looking to make the change but not implement the, the actual compensation, that's something that, that I think they, they, that it could do, um, you know, obviously with the approval of town meeting. Mr. Gilberto, are we supposed to even be discussing this? I mean, wouldn't this impact all five of us directly? and? Is this even something we're supposed to be even talking about? I, I did check on that, Madam Chair, um, with town council. And, um, you, I, you know, for, for good or for bad, this is the body that, that needs to discuss it. It becomes an issue of necessity. If there's going to be a discussion of it, they can't really oh, I see. discuss okay. elsewhere. Uh, but I, I do understand the question for sure. And I did ask Darren, uh, town council, yeah. about that just to make sure we weren't running afoul of anything. Okay, <laughs> all right. It's like when Congress gives themselves a raise. <laughs> well, I mean, and then ultimately it goes to the it goes to the town to say yes or no. So Correct. Like we always say the town town yeah. vote rules. So, so in, in relation to your insight, Michael, in relation to the uh, the benefits, and or do you say you had information? You have information. I do. Uh, I'm uh, and you know I, I tried to kind of better understand exactly how it how it all works. So, you know, effectively, you know, what happens is for municipal employees, any employee who is working um, 20 or more hours, I believe it's 20 or more hours and not more than 20 hours, would become eligible for health insurance. Um, however, for elected um, officials, um, there is no standard that is applied in terms of the hours it actually becomes uh, a decision for the select board whether or not elected officials are eligible for um, health insurance benefits. Um, a key that makes would make an elected official eligible is being paid, obviously. So um, not being paid, you would not be eligible. Being paid, the select board then is able to make a determination whether you are or are not eligible um, for for that um, for health insurance benefits. Um, Interestingly, you know, because our doing this would require a change to the town's charter and a subsequent act of the legislature, if the board wished to restrict individuals, elected officials from being eligible for health insurance, we could attempt to do that through the language in the special act. That's something that town council had suggested in the conversation. So if you if you were concerned that that, that, that you know, wasn't something that you wanted to be um, a benefit that would be available uh, in the future. We may be able to address that through the language in the special act. The second component is um, for um, retirement purposes. And uh, basically in order for, to be eligible to contribute to the, con to the retirement system, in our case, it'd be Middlesex County retirement system, um, the stipend or compensation would need to be um, five thousand dollars or or greater. Um, if it was four thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars or less, um, the, the, the those receiving the compensation would not be eligible to join the um, contributory retirement system and not able to count the time as credible service. 
And if you recall, I, I had offered some just kind of off the cuff comment um, a few weeks ago about what the range is, and it normally would it goes up to to that you know that threshold um, of just under five thousand dollars. But so that that's what I was able to find, um, you know, to just provide the information again. That, you know, I. I, I came up in the conversation in the board's meeting and I, um, you know, we tried to do the research since then to give you some information to guide in, in your deliberations. Mrs. Gonzalez. So um, when I brought this up, that my intention was just a stipend and, you know, not health insurance, not retirement. And I think most towns that is what they go by. They, they keep it under that amount so that um, it doesn't go into retirement and it doesn't qualify for health insurance so that it truly is just a stipend. Um, uh, what little research I've done, I haven't done a lot. I was going to delve more into it. Um, that's what I saw. And most of the towns that do this, they keep it under, was it 5,000, Mr. Gilberto? Yes. Um, yeah, so that it doesn't qualify for those other things. Um, did you do some, do you have a sense in terms of your research of what the neighboring communities pay their select boards like Reading and Linfield and uh, Wilmington. North, Andover North, Andover, Wilmington? So I believe most of them do get a stipend. Um, for the most part, and they vary from town to town. Um, some of them, the chair gets more of a stipend than the members. Um, so I, I really think that each board can kind of adapt it to how they feel they want it. I mean, I think as by way of, a, of an article, if we're voting to put this on an article, we would really want to flesh that out and have a you yeah. know, have a, an ex explanation of that. You know, this is what the area board, you know, select boards, town board stipends are. And retirement's also tied to years of service. So the only one that would be eligible for it would be Mr. O'Leary, probably <laughs> like three times over now. So it, it's tied into, you can't, you're not eligible unless you stick around for a while. Well, you, also, you also cannot double dip. In other words, if mm -hmm. right. you're eligible at the local level, but you also work for state government, you can't double count. You yeah. can't double dip on anything. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I, I would be willing. To, I, I feel like this is kind of a rushed situation for this town meeting. So um, this might be something we want to keep um, open and discuss and maybe get it on to the next warrant. I mean, that's uh, got. More information as we prepare the warrant, Mr. Walner. Yeah, I think I think more information is pretty clear. I'm, I'm not for it or against it. I just don't have enough information to mm -hmm. really make a decision. But I think that, like last year when we were doing this meeting outside, anticipating the sun, that our goal is really to get to this meeting as quick and as fast as we possibly can, without any undue issues that might slow us down. And I'm looking at this entire agenda. We have some issues on here. Yeah. That really suck yeah. up. So I think it'd be prudent to put it off to another meeting when we have more chance to think about it and study it and not try to this one. I think it's just too rushed at this point. Again, I'm not for or against it. Mm -hmm. Thinking it's just bad optics and bad timing. That's all. So Mr. Gilberto, let's back into the town, the June uh, town meeting. The warrant has to be uh, a approved and signed by us on May, what date? When does uh, it... May 10th, I believe, Madam Chair. Okay. And we have to finalize it. We're looking at this pretty early, but that's gonna take maybe one or two more times for us to finalize as well. So um, I guess we could get some more information and then decide to, to you know, or decide now to postpone it. It's, what's the pleasure of the board? Mr. I, I would I would suggest postponing it. I, um, Mr. Gonzalez postpone. Mr. Walner postpone. Yeah, I think Mr. Studo. Mr. O'Leary. I've, I've waited this long, sure. No. <laughs> <laughs> like I, said, we, it is, I didn't see anything There's in no here. No retroactive. No retroactive stuff. No. <laughs> um, okay. 
So, <laughs> so maybe we can, yeah, pull that one out for the moment. I, I think Mr. Walma's point is well, well made. You know, we really, we, we have a enormous yeah. warrant here. All right, so we'll, so the consensus is we'll get some more information on this and maybe revisit it for the next, for the next uh, town, town meeting. Um, and so, Mr. Gilberto, was there, what, there were other things here that you wanted to yes. call to our attention? Yes. Just moving through the warrant, this is the customary operating budget article. Um, these are uh, annually occurring articles for which we'll have a dollar amounts for you um, at the next meeting. Um, article 20 was submitted by the school committee and um, this is addressing that um, special fund that you mentioned earlier, Madam Chair, for special education costs or out of district, to, out of, out of district tuition or transportation. Um, they are um, proposing that a transfer be made and that is something that we'll be discussing with the financial planning team. I expect it'll be a transfer from one-time funds, probably free cash, um, to bolster the balance um, of, that, um, of that account. And uh, we'll report back um, once there's a recommendation that's been made. Um, I, I did see there were members of the school committee who were on here. I, I, I don't know if there's anything that Madam Chair, through you, they wish to add. I can't see. I can only I'm gonna stop the share again. Sorry about that. All right. Oh, we have Mr. Buckley joining us. Hello, Welcome, friend. Mr. Buckley. Hello, friend. What a treat. Thank you, Mr. McGowan's here as well. Now, um, I, we... <clears throat> the, the idea here a couple of years ago, and I think Mrs. Mendepelli was in on the finance planning team when this got put on there. I think it was actually um, Mr. Prisco's suggestion. The idea of this fund was just every once in a while we have students move in over the summer and out of district placements can be very expensive. And so we set a budget around now for next year's students. And the concern was just that, because a couple of years ago, we had a very expensive uh, case move into town. And the concern would be if you set the budget and then you have a very you know, high expense move in, what would we do? And so we wouldn't want to have to go to town meeting you know, to try to ask for additional funds at that point in time. So the idea came up to put a reserve fund or some sort of fund aside where money would be put in there. It wouldn't be used for you know, most things, it would really just be somebody moves in, it would be a way not to have to go necessarily right to a town meeting, and it would be voted mm -hmm. on by both the select board and the school committee to even use those funds. And so we put, I think, $100,000 in when the, when the fund was established a couple of years ago. The idea was that we were going to put a little bit of money in every couple of years, just to have a little bit of a balance in there to deal with, you know, extraordinary expenses that might come up um, that weren't anticipated. So, that was just something that Mr. Connolly, uh, Mike Connolly on our, our team had suggested that, you know, we had talked about putting a little bit more fun into that account, you know, every couple of years. And that's why we are bringing it up again. Mr. Buckley, what's the balance right now in that reserve fund? I believe we put $100,000 in when it was created and nothing has been put in since then. It has any been used, I mean. No, no, the, the, the select board would have to vote to use it as well. So it would, yeah. be a, it would be a vote by both the school committee and the select board to use it. Yes. It would just be something that would, if something happened over the summer, we, we wouldn't have to call a special town meeting or anything to try to you know, do this. Because there are some out of district placements that can be hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's just the concern. And so it would just be a way that you know, the school's not using the money. You would know if there was any request. And we haven't made a request, even when you know, some small amounts and, Things do change year over year, but you know I, we don't anticipate using it in the near future. That's not the goal. It's just to have some money in case one of those cases were to come in. Okay. So the reserve fund previously, we used to have to an annually renew it or vote to renew it, but we don't need to do that anymore. So that's why this is this is just coming up now, and it's coming up now for more of an infusion into that fund to sort of shore up the fund. Correct. I think I think there's a certain percentage of the overall um, balance uh, or the overall school budget that can be put into a fund like this. The yes. law. I, I forget what the percentage yes. is, 
But I think the total amount that we could put in there would be around 500,000. We're not talking about that. We're just talking about slowly putting a little bit in, you know, as we can, just in case in the future there is, you know, one of those big expenses that we're to move into town. Yeah, the balance in such reserve fund shall not exceed 2% of the annual net school spending of the school district. I think we're way below that, unfortunately. All right, so is there a proposed amount that you that is the school is asking for? I mean, I, I love all of it, but no, I'm just kidding. I, I think we were going to talk about it at finance planning. Okay. So I think we would... Um, Good. Okay. Yes, talk there. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, no, I, I get it. I've been in support of this idea uh, because I recall in years past, you know, the school department has had someone move to town. I recall one year a family moved to town and three kids um, were eligible and in, in need of services and it was just totally unanticipated. And the balancing act began, you know, as to how, how we're going to uh, address the needs. Um, so to me, I think, you know, the financial planning team should establish some sort of a goal in, in relation to, um, you know, how much money do we want to have a reserve here? And then just annually put some money at it and whether it's going to be over a five-year time period, unless, again, unless there's a hit to it, but just, we should just get on course to appropriate a certain amount to a certain level. Um, and then we reach that level, you know, there's no need for it appropriate, but I think it should be on our radar screen every year. Um, yeah to appropriate a certain dollar amount. And I think the financial planning team should establish you know, what the goal is gonna be and then what the annual amount is gonna be. Even if it's $25,000 a year or $50,000 a year till we get to 300,000, 400,000, whatever it is. Uh, because it doesn't take long to eat it up. You know. Okay, thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? All right, Mr. Buckley, was there any other warrant article that you are here on? No, I'm just right. here because I, I enjoy hearing all of you. No, I, I actually had a meeting in the middle of this, so I missed the revenue. Uh, plan, but um, well, no, you're going to get I a bill for trash removal, so <laughs> you missed that part. I know. I, I heard some <laughs> of it. I didn't. I didn't hear the final outcome, but I, I'm no, being texted the, that. The final outcome is review. We'll just we have to review that more carefully. All right, but thank you for joining us and thank you for the explanation and, and more to come with regard to that warrant article after the financial planning. You get the, you get the rental revolving fund also. Yeah. Miss, I know Mr. Gilberto is gonna call that up now. Yes, yeah, so there is an article that the school committee proposed, which is to create a school rental revolving fund. It says a sponsor is a select board, but I believe it was submitted by the school committee. So we'll correct that. Um, and it was for uh, revenue uh, received in connection with rental payments for the leasing of surplus space in or on a school funds to be expended for the upkeep and maintenance of any facility under the control of the school committee and for any balance to remain in said fund rather than to revert to the general fund as voted in the general law chapter 40 section three. So this was something that the um, school committee was um, had proposed. And I believe that was also at the recommendation of Mr. Conley, uh, Mr. Buckley. And I do apologize, folks. I did not ask Mr. Conley or Superintendent Daly to be with us this evening. So it's kind of defaulting back to Mr. Buckley. <laughs> but you're doing a great okay. job so far, sir. But Mr. Buckley, right now, anything that the school has for receives for leasing doesn't go to the general fund. This is just to propose setting up a reserve fund to put that money into. I will be honest, I'm not as familiar with this, of, of where it goes right now, but I think this is, as you're mentioning, I think this is Mr. Connolly wanting to be a little bit more, you know, specific about how it comes in and how it's held. But Mr. O'Leary, I think, is going to comment and correct me on this. No, I'm not going to correct you. I'm going to just uh, support again. If you recall, we had uh, an article in town meeting to uh, allow for the solar panels to go on top of the buildings. <clears throat> and throughout all that discussion, and even with the support of, the, of uh, the select board at the time, was to recognize that the revenue from that source would uh, be under the control of the school department to offset um, maintenance of facilities. So this, this is just following through. This is just following through on our initial proposal that which was approved by town meeting to allow for the leasing of the space on the school buildings and all the discussion we had at that time was that those revenues would go back to help offset the cost of maintenance on school buildings. 
So it was it was not going to go to the general fund. That was the consensus. Okay, so, so there's a need. So to this do this just I this just already, effectuates. I thought we already did that though. In that yeah. we authorized them. Yeah, we authorized them to lease the space, but we haven't. And and uh, and use the, have a pit use the, the funds where it's so going. We have to establish a reserve fund for that, Mr. Gilberto. It'd be a revolving fund, Madam Chair. Excuse me, a revolving fund. Yes. Yeah, so otherwise, it, otherwise it, we'll go with the general government. Was it was it for that, or is this for like the the yeah, rental? Because we already spaces? did that. I believe we already did that. Or is this for other rental spaces, like the re re rental of the gym and you know the performing right. arts center and things like that? Which, are, which is done now, but it might be just, and I, again, I'm not really sure why Mr. Connolly thought it was a better way of doing it. I'm guessing it was just a, a, a more appropriate way to hold the funds in a revolving account. Madam Chair, I, I was under the impression it was for, for all, all the facilities that yes. were being rented, yeah. but I, what I'll do is I'll ask uh, Mr. Connolly and the superintendent to join us for the next meeting to discuss in detail sure. exactly sure. what it, it, it could right. be that it's as being described by Mr. O'Leary. I don't uh, it could be more broad also, but yeah. Are there any are there any sources of rental income of the facilities from the school department that currently go to the general fund? I don't believe that there are any going yeah. to the general fund, but they may not be going into a revolving fund. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so the revolving fund gives them more liberty to right. to address immediate concerns or needs. Yeah. I believe right now, Mr. O'Leary, they just offset the requests that were that were we make so like our expenses were are being right. offset by anything and that was one of that was one of the things that was down this year obviously is there has been very little rental income from from the gym and the performing arts center but this also allows for a lot more flexibility to address immediate needs for the facility without having to go for additional appropriation i think it's a good idea okay Mr. Gilbert, thank you, Mr. Buckley again. Mr. Gilberto, any other, um, you want to call any other articles? This is, Article 28 is related and it would actually set the dollar amount which we're required to do um, separately for that revolving fund, revolving fund and we will work with the school department to determine what that dollar amount ought to be. We also have an article on here that contemplates updating any of the other existing revolving funds and updating those dollar amounts to reflect whatever the activity has been. It may, has been. It may be that there's no changes that are necessary, but this is an opportunity for us to review those um, and to adjust them accordingly. Um, article 30 through 33 either are have come from the planning commission or are um, there or or the planning commission has the information um, regarding those articles. So I know the town planner is here and I know that the petitioner is um, for one of the articles is also here as well. Um, Madam Chair, through you to the town planner, the first of the articles is the small cell wireless facilities article. Um, could I ask Madam Chair, through you to the town planner, just you could give a quick update as to you know, what the intent is with that article? Sure. So this is an article that um, would regulate small wireless facilities on private property outside of rights of way. Um, I have been working with town council on um, a few things. Um, one is a policy um, intended for the select board eventually um, that would allow you to um, <clears throat> regulate utility and small wireless installations within rights of way. And part of that policy is an aesthetics policy um, and kind of as a companion to that, but in a different, um, you know, regulated instead um, through zoning and, and through the CPC is a zoning, which includes installations like that on private property. And that would be our only mechanism for regulating um, those installations on private property. So that's something that um, I, I've worked with uh, town council on on this warrant article and instead as opposed to the the select board policy which has an aesthetics section worked into it. This is a zoning bylaw that refers to a similar aesthetics policy that the CPC will have to keep on file. And the recommendation was not to make it part of the zoning because every time we needed to change something we don't want to have to go back to town meetings. So this is a Kind of a simple scheme. What it would do is it would require um, new applications to be made 
that would um, <clears throat> undergo a very short and simplified type of site plan review by the by the planning commission, and um, and it's different from what we have for regular uh, wireless facilities because the time frame we have to review it is shorter and um, we have less oversight. So um, KP has recommended to us this procedure whereby um, facilities that come in that are intended to be on private properties would come in for this abbreviated site plan review. The planning commission does a very, um, you know, do, does a public notice and hopefully tackles it in, in, in one meeting because we really don't have time. We don't have a lot of time to look at these. Um, and then um, what we will need to do in the, in the next few months, assuming this, you know, is successful at town meeting is we will need to develop an aesthetics policy that, that goes along with this, but is not part of the zoning. Um, now, KP has also advised us that it's best if the aesthetics policies um, are, are consistent with each other. Um, so it's going to be the same as what we're going to be recommending to the select board that you would pass as part of the um, policy to govern um, what goes on in the right of way. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of the process for this. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I realize my explanation for this sounds a little complicated and it's just, it's been a real, real tangle. <laughs> To, to get through all this, but. Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Calferdo. Thank you. I'm gonna stop the share again. Um, could, could, through you to the town planner. So um, could you just explain for the board and for the community the reason this action is being recommended? Um, yeah, it's, so these small wireless facilities are starting to come to some communities. Um, they mostly have been coming to larger and denser communities than North Reading. Um, we haven't had any inquiries yet, to my knowledge, but we would like to be ready um, if, if they do come. I've had some conversations with RMLD and they have encouraged us to get an aesthetics policy together um, because they believe based on conversations they've had with um, cell carriers that when interest does come to North Reading, eventually, if it does, it will be for location on their poles. So most likely what we will be looking at is requests to put installations on RMLD poles on Route 28. That's what RMLD believes um, based on trends and conversations. That's where they believe this is going. I think it's very unlikely we ever will have a proposal for private property that we would have to use this zoning bylaw for, but it'd be really good to have it in place because if we don't have one and someone does want to do one, we don't want to be stuck not having any regulation. So um, RMLD has been really, you know, very helpful in trying to guide us. Um, I know Reading has received some inquiries about installing these facilities on RMLD polls also on Route 28. That seems to be where, where the interest is. So RMLD has shared with us their specifications and they have asked us please to make sure that whatever we pass is, um, you know, can be consistent with what they do and what they're required to do um, because otherwise um, we're, we're going to run into some problems with what can go on their polls. Um, so while I don't have a full aesthetics policy for you to look at or recommendation for the right of way policy for which eventually I, I you know, the CPC will recommend to you um, so that you can take action on totally separately from town meeting. Um, I, I should have that for you soon. Um, it's, it, it's, it's going to be, um, it, it, it's going to have certain things like how, what are the minimum heights and maximum heights? How big can these things be? How far can they be from people's homes? Um, things like pole diameters, um, but I've been in discussion with RMLD about which of these things are, are reasonable to regulate and which of these things um, I just don't make any sense that, um, you know, we, for an example would be, it's not a great idea to say, here's a maximum diameter that a pole can be because they have their own requirements for how wide poles have to be based on what is installed in them. So I have been working with them. They've been very, very helpful in offering guidance. They've offered to review whatever aesthetics regulations we come up with and to be sure that they're consistent and they've shared their, their specifications with me too. So we're just trying to keep these on track. Um, and so eventually, eventually it may come to pass that you know Verizon or some other car uh, carrier wants to install um, either in a public way or on private property. And when that day comes, we would like to be prepared with the right of way policy and or, you know, both hopefully and the zoning policy. Any comment or question? Mrs. Gonzalez. Yeah, I happen to have sat in on that meeting um, when that was being discussed and it was 
very enlightening. And I think that it's um, fantastic that we're thinking ahead this way. Um, it's basically for the 5G, correct? Right. right. Yeah, that they'll want be wanting to install. And, you know, just things that if you're not prepared and they could put it outside your picture window that you used to look at a pretty tree you liked and now you have this, <laughs> you know, thing on your on your tree or your pole. So um, I, I commend the, I commend you for thinking ahead and planning ahead for this. Anyone else? No, Who's I concur. Gonna... Just thank you for being proactive about it because again, technology is changing and it's gonna have an impact uh, on our community as well as the services we, we're gonna be needing and desiring, but also from an aesthetic standpoint, uh, just look around on the polls already and you see it, you know, so it's, uh, I think it's important. And again, I applaud your efforts to get in front of it. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Well, you, I mean, you can applaud the town administrator because he's kind of been pushing for it. Otherwise we probably would have kept putting it off. Well, thank you. <laughs> we have so many other okay. things. So. Um, okay. Any other questions or comments? I do. I, I have, I think it definitely needs to be fleshed out. Uh, beyond what we see in this warrant article. So I think maybe if we did that, took the time to do that in the next month before we approve it, otherwise it should probably mm -hmm. wait till the next town meeting because it's not quite there yet. I think we need to have a fee, you know, we, we should charge a fee to apply. I think we need to have some emissions, expert emissions, um, standards and reports that we receive from anyone that's proposing this um, for the radiation that these emit. I think we need to have, uh, you know, some sort of guidance or guidelines that are beyond just what our MLD is telling us. I think we need to add in a provision that if, if it's one of our polls or use of our street that we would have a licensing agreement with the carrier that's proposing this what's going to happen is they're going to come in and it, it's not going to matter whether or not there's a service need the first in time gets wins the race so you'll see five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen petitions from one carrier followed by 12 from another carrier so i think it's fantastic to to put this on but i, I think it needs to be fleshed out more so that there's a lot more detail to it um, so that a carrier knows what they need to do to apply and what they need to present to the CPC if that's going to be the permit granting authority for it. So for, for whatever reason, the policy that would be, that was intended to be for the select board to pass for within the right of way is many, 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 many pages long and it's very detailed and it's full of all of the specifications, all of the aesthetics rules, all of the application fees and procedures and everything else. Um, but oh, I didn't see that. Mrs. Right. So that's not, that hasn't been given to you yet because it is separate from the zoning policy. KP wasn't recommending that we put all of those things into the zoning bylaw because every time one of those things needed to change, we would have to go back to town meeting. So their recommendation was to have a zoning bylaw that really just reflects referred to a policy that the CPC will be keeping on file. That policy can change many times and the intent is for it to be consistent with what the select board's policy eventually will be. And the select board can pass the policy you know, whenever you want and then you can change it whenever you need to without having to go back to town meeting. So that's why this is a really basic simple document and the policy itself, like the aesthetics guidelines themselves and, and the application and everything else will be much longer. So I don't know, um, you know, it, I don't know at what point you'll want to look at kind of the companion to this. They don't have to be passed at the same time. They can be. We certainly can wait until October if you prefer. Um, the CPC was almost ready to, to recommend um, the policy, but it's really long and it, it, they needed more time to look at it and, and digest it. So, um, I mean, it can be looked at now or later. I, I guess whatever, however you want to do it is fine. Does it have to be, I, I'm not understanding why it would be a zoning bylaw. Why wouldn't it just be a bylaw? So the zoning this bylaw. Really, this isn't really, this is more like permission to, permission to install, license to install or obtaining a license to be able to install. Um, 
the the license to install would be for the for what goes into the public rights of way mm -hmm. and that would be for the select board policy um because the board governs utilities um but the zoning bylaw governs what goes on private property so if someone should turn up and want to put some rooftop installation or a pole on their own private property or a company's private property, that's when the zoning bylaw would kick in. And that's when we would do um, an abbreviated site plan review for it. And that's when it would refer back to whatever aesthetics policy the CPC would then have on file. Okay. So the only reason to... <laughs> so we need to marry our policy with the CPC policy. It should be consistent. Right. That's, that's the right. recommendation. They don't have to be. If you prefer to have certain things in your policy and the CPC prefers to have other things, it could be a little different, but the, the best thing would be for them to be consistent with each other, private and public property. Can we see that? Can you share that with us as we're kind of trying to finalize the warrant? Oh yeah, definitely. I can send it to you. What I, I discussed it with the CPC at their last meeting. We've had a couple meetings about it. It it had to it needed a, it needed more work. And by the time they got it, they didn't really have a chance to fully digest it and be able to give a recommendation to the board. But I think they will be soon. Um, I, I know they'd like to wrap it up. That'd be great if you could share that with us. Yeah, because I know there's a lot of work put into this this. So it would help to see that. But when I looked at that, I got confused. Because it's just a, just a, almost like a paragraph, a one page paragraph. So I know there's a lot more to it that I, I would appreciate it if you could share that with us too. Sure, sure. Great. All right. That's, are you, do you have another, are you on, a, you are on the other warrant articles, right? You're here for the other warrant articles that are in the. Right. Yeah. Not Concord, but I mean, I can answer questions about Concord if need be, but. Um, I, I can try that, but I mean, it's a citizen's petition, but um, I have been working um, with uh, Mr. Let's let Mr. Let's let Mr. Gilberto just call, he'll share that with us again. I think there's three pertaining to zoning, right, Mr. Gilberto? Uh, it's, it, I believe it's three, uh, three or four. Um, yeah. the, the second of them is the senior housing overlay zoning district. Danielle, which I know that, that the planning um, commission has been working on with the developer of the proposed developer. Right. Um, so this is um, a zoning bylaw that would create a policy, uh, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> it would create an overlay on three parcels, uh, 146, 148, and 150 Park Street. And um, those are all zoned local business. So what this overlay would do, would, would, it would further enable um, um, uh, folks, I'm going to just ask, I'm going to ask everyone to hold on one second. I'm going to mute everybody, and then Madam Chair and Ms. McKnight, if you could unmute yes. yourself, that would be great. That's good. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Gilbert. I was getting a lot of feedback, Ms. McKnight. So yeah. Okay. So this. Uh, overlay would um, would add to the uses um, that are currently allowed in the underlying local business and it would, would enable uh, age-restricted multifamily housing um, with an affordability component required on site um, with the units being affordable in perpetuity and um, the the way this came about was um, uh, Mr. Wheeler who owns the properties um, and his attorneys have been working on this um, senior housing project uh, that, that would have some affordable units in it. Um, they've been working with an arch architect as well. Um, they've presented to the CPC on a number of occasions um, doing some workshop discussions and um, they have proposed zoning that um, would enable a maximum of 50 units on the, on the total site that they own, the, the three properties. Um, with eight units being affordable <clears throat> and with one um, occupant required to be 55 or older. And through the conversations and um, discussions that, that the uh, CPC had uh, about the project uh, with the developer, the CPC decided that they, they liked the project enough to want to sponsor it at town meeting rather than asking Mr. Wheeler to do a citizen's petition. Um, so they felt that it was very consistent with um, the recommendations of our housing production plan and master plan, which is to um, provide for some affordable housing, to provide for some um, 
senior housing and some senior affordable housing. Um, and, you know, in addition to that, I think they took a lot of uh, comfort in knowing that the applicant had also met on a few occasions with the Historic District Commission um, because the project in that location wouldn't go anywhere <laughs> without um, the blessing of the, um, the HDC. So um, that is, it, it's, it's a project that I think the, the CPC was looking on, you know, positively as being um, an opportunity to redevelop a, you know, a previously developed site, which I, I think it's according to the, you know, the applicant let me know that it had been pre previously been um, a site uh, for manufacturing wagons. And um, there uh, was, I, I, I've been putting together a presentation. I don't, I don't know how much detail you want about it now. I mean, I have a presentation to give at the, you know, at the public hearing for warrant articles and, and you know, and at town meeting. Um, but the, the site is um, intended to be developed basically in the same areas that it's developed now, but with all of the existing structures uh, removed and rebuilt um, into um, a plan that includes um, condominiums with uh, the, uh, the, histori the historic building on it um, worked into the site um, in a very aesthetically pleasing way, um, reoriented a little bit on the site and would remain Mr. Wheeler's office. Um, so, we would be losing a couple of the businesses that are there right now. Um, there's Lou's Automotive and there is um, the, uh, the, there's a steel products company that's on the site right now. Um, I had never walked the site until you know, pretty recently, but looking at it, um, you can see that there is a, there's sort of a line that goes down where the riverfront area and the wetlands area begins. The site isn't really developed past that point and isn't intended to be developed. Um, the proposed development and the, and the currently disturbed portion of the sites are, are pretty much the same. Um, it's near flood zone, but the buildings aren't proposed to be in the flood zone. It's kind of outside those sensitive areas. So the, the developer had worked with an architect to put together some um, renderings to show what the, the end result project would look like, a couple of perspectives from the town center to see, um, to, you know, to show what the view would look like, you know, for example, like from the Flint Library. And uh, I know that the applicant continues to work and you know, meet with uh, the Historic District Commission to um, eventually on an eventual, um, you know, discussing an eventual submittal um, where they'll be asking for a certificate of appropriateness. Um, and it would be anticipated that the project would need um, a site plan review uh, and the, the special permit that this bylaw would provide for, for the, for the senior housing, as well as um, filing with the Conservation Commission and the Historic District Commission. Um, so kind of this is a project that was um, developed and the bylaw written tailored to this project. This is the end result that would be in, you know, that the developer has in mind. Um, the first step being, you know, passage at town meeting and then the developer would have to apply for um, all of the various permits to, to actually develop the site. Okay, and I think I think the, the developer did come to uh, one of our meetings to um, discuss this, and I think we were left with some questions with regard to this. And um, I believe the expectation that we were going to see more and hear more information, specifically what we saw for plans, um, didn't. I think we were looking for more detail to what we saw, and I think that that the the architect that was at our meeting that he had those, but he, he just had, wasn't, he had them, he didn't have them ready for the meeting. And, and there were questions with regard to the proximity, of course, to Ipswich River Park with, re, with respect to this um, location, which is it's, it, uh, not the park, the river, Ipswich River, Ipswich River. So I think with those were some questions left. Do my, do my colleagues have any questions with regard to this article? Mr. Mr. No, Mr. Studo. Uh, yes. Um, so one of the things, and I've um, I've been following this closely as liaison on the CPC, so I've seen a lot of it. But one thing that we got just recently, and I didn't have time because it's um, pretty lengthy, but. If there's maybe somebody who can uh, just briefly describe some of that, uh, two questions, what the environmental impact so far we think would be and whether or not it would be appropriate to put some of those 
if there has to be some sort of restriction of how far you are from the YIV switch of whether or not it should go under the dimensional density and design regulations of the actual overlay. So it's, you know, maybe I'm saying this right, where it's codified that, you know, this is how town meeting voted for it. So it needs to be that exactly what it needs to be, or you don't qualify. So again, just, uh, I, I just didn't have time to look at the report and summary and, you know, but that's one thing that I know up to this point has not been discussed in any of the CPC meetings I've been on the environmental impact at all. So, you know, I think it's, you know, better probably discussed now rather than, you know, open floor a town meeting, which as Mr. Walner pointed out, we're trying to, you know, oh, yeah. not open it up to a two hour debate, which almost certainly will end it in not getting voted on based on some of the past projects where environmental impacts. Well, I think it's important then. I know some of some of my colleagues have, and I see a, a, a hand raised too from an attendee, but I think it's important for us to, re, we're talking about review of warrant articles. And so now we're, we're veering off and talking about a specific development or proposal. And we did hear about that. I think it, it, it de probably deserves a little bit more attention at a meeting where that is posted. Um, I, I understand there's a warrant article, but if we're specifically going to be talk, following up on some of this, and I did look at the environmental report, and it is 257 pages, but it looked like nothing was detected, you know, when you go to the testing in the end. So, and it was a phase two after a phase one, and I did have questions about where the borings were placed in, you know, comparison to where the buildings are going to be built, etc. But I don't think that right now in this particular warrant article, unless we had listed out specifically this proposed development, I, I think we should put it on another agenda for some further follow-up. And I'm sure the CPC is going to be doing that too, um, you know, to answer those questions. There's a, seems like there's a lot of unanswered questions to it. So, but for the moment, for the warrant article, and then I'd, I'd like to go to, since we, we had public comment for the previous matters of discussion. I'd just like to see what my colleagues' thoughts are or questions are, or if there might be other things while we have the planner here. Mr. O'Leary. Just, uh, Danielle, maybe you can, can help me out here. The Planning Commission, I know this is a, a first step for senior housing overlay districts. Mm -hmm. District. This is a district, and it's specific to uh, one proposal that's been put forth for consideration, mm -hmm. which is, causing us to consider rezoning. Uh, what are the plans of the Planning Commission to expand senior housing overlay districts? You know, my, my only concern about this is that, you know, well, it gets around spot zoning. It's spot zoning. It's specific to, to a proposal that's being put forth by, by a, a very reputable developer who I, I have the utmost respect for. Um, but to me, it, why wouldn't we be looking broader and saying that we has as we have in the past for affordable housing district overlay districts you know why why aren't we looking at more locations in town to consider because this this bylaw is specific for these three parcels it's not specific to anywhere else in town that's so true what, um it's, I, I think that, I mean, my, my feeling about it was that it probably wouldn't be spot zoning because it's three properties rather than just one, but you're right that it would just be one project um, and not far away, of course, the Haverhill Street condominiums um, are, you know, just two properties that were put in their own zoning district. Um, as far as putting additional properties into this overlay, it's certainly something that's possible. Um, we haven't looked at a larger area where it could go. I don't know how large an area we would necessarily want or need it to be. We definitely have other plans for senior housing elsewhere in town, one of them being the Carpenter Drive property, which would also be a senior affordable housing project. And then the Pulte project, which is lots and lots of 55 plus housing. So I don't know beyond those sites, I just don't know how many more sites we would want zoned that way, but it certainly is an option. It's something to, to think about and consider. The, the CPC hasn't identified any further properties though that would um, 
that it's recommending right now for inclusion. I know that um, at, at one point, um, the developer's attorney had made some suggestions for a few additional properties in the town center that could um, that might make sense. Um, they had put some provisions into this bylaw that required it to be um, within some kind of close proximity of um, certain facilities so that we're not creating new senior housing districts kind of in the middle of nowhere. They should be within walking distance of something. So um, in terms of, you know, library, et cetera. Um, and there were lots of locations around the town center where it could be possible to expand this district. I don't know if we would want to go right out of the gate with a, a, a much bigger district that then we would probably want to be careful about, well, exactly how many housing units are we putting in the town center? That might be great, but we also might end up rezoning some property that now has the capacity to add quite a bit more housing than maybe we had thought about or maybe that we've identified for that part of town. Um, I mean, certainly I, I'm sure they would be open to discussion about expanding this further. I think they were thinking maybe start small. This is a pretty substantial project for the town center already at 50 units. So I don't think they were recommending any more yet. Okay, and again, so my, my own, my, my first level of apprehension is, is that it, it's, it's project specific mm -hmm. rather than global thinking. Mm -hmm. you know, and maybe it's because someone came forward with a proposal, but uh, as opposed to what are we really looking to do and where are we looking to have it happen? And uh, that's my, my level of apprehension at this point, in, in that this is so specific um, to a proposal rather than that way around, you know. But it, yeah. it's true that this was never identified previously as a site for housing. I don't think anyone thought of it, just privately owned. It was used for, you know, a couple of businesses um, in an office, and I, it just wasn't on anyone's radar. Um, and then, you know, Mr. Wheeler and his attorney came to the CPC and presented the idea for the project and they really liked it and thought it could really enhance, you know, the town center and meet some of our needs. And so that's really how it came about. But you're right, we hadn't identified it previously. This location is not in the housing production plan. Truly nobody thought about it. Um, but now that it's come up, I think they think it's a good idea. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mr. Walnut, did you have your hand raised? I did, but I'm going to withdraw because I think you're right, uh, Chair, that there'll be more details coming up in the future. So I don't want to extend this further than it has to be. So thank you. Ms. Gonzalez, did you have any? No. I think I just from, from follow up to what Mr. O'Leary is saying, I, 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 my concern is a developer identifying areas. And, and I think it's, it's, you know, that's a problem. If we're not identifying them or we're not following through, and we certainly have a need for senior housing, but we have a need for affordable senior housing. And it wasn't probably incorporated into the plan, probably for the same reason as Elm Street up the road wasn't because it's right on the river. So I think we have to be mindful of that too, in terms of where we're allowing larger developments like that. That's a concern. I think we should we should delve into a little bit more deeply. Um, but I also think um, I also think we need the affordable senior housing. That's what we we've talked about. And I notice in this article that there's a proposal at fifteen percent. And I'm wondering how that. My question is how did the CPC arrive at fifteen percent? instead of 20% of what is being proposed or more affordable units? Well, initially there were no affordable units. Um, the CPC had asked the applicant if he would consider putting some affordable units in um, and said they would look at the project and, and get back to us, uh, which they did. And, um, you know, I think that 15% had been the maximum that was financially feasible for a project of this scale for them, for the, for the particular project that they had in mind. Um, I think beyond that, we would probably be looking at more units. Um, and actually at 20%, it would, it would just be a 40B. So it could be pretty much as many units as they wanted. So I think it's because it's a smaller scale project. Um, but I, in terms of answering questions about why that's the maximum, like why, why was that the upper limit for the number of units? Um, I mean, that is a financial question and I would probably just okay. defer to the applicant or his attorney to answer that because um, that's, you know, 
you know, again, we're, we're probably getting and delving into the development itself versus just the warrant article and if our review of the warrant article. But I think it's it's key. some of this is key. So I appreciate yeah, you. Well, it's develop is the development that's driving the warrant article. So exactly. The, yeah, so right, the right. specifics of the financial specifics of the uh, development is what's uh, driving the specifics of the zoning bylaw. All right. I have two hands up now, so I am going to. I am, and again, this isn't a public hearing, but um, we did take public comment or question. So, Mr. Valenti, you have to unmute. <clears throat> Thanks, Madam Chair. This is Stephen Valenti at Six Hayward Farms and a member of DIRC at the Fenwick Switch River Committee. And um, you know, I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you for the transparency on all of this, we're, we're obviously concerned, and as you stated, with this project being so close to the river on you know, kind of getting any information from the town as to how we're protecting that precious resource that we have in our area. And it, it's kind of interesting uh, that you guys are all very aware of that. And um, frankly, um, I know it's a, a concern for everybody um, but is there going to be more studies done on the environmental impact or is there a checks and balances that's happening with what's going on with the sewage treatment when they propose that many housings and who, who's watching that? May I share my screen? I think it would be helpful if I showed a site plan and where the septic system would be proposed versus where the riparian zone is. I don't know if you want to get into that. I know it's not a zoning question. I I guess maybe then I'll just give a quick answer if I can. No, and I mean I I don't I think we saw that from the developer when the developer came to speak to us about it. I may be confusing meetings, but to my colleagues, the developer did come and speak to us about this. Okay, right. I'm sorry. There's so many <laughs> so many meetings. Yeah. All right. So I, I think we saw that. I think we we saw, but I. I think in the environmental report, it was quite baffling that they don't even know where the septic systems are located. They're guessing right. on the environmental report. So these details, I think, are important to kind of get some more information from the developer on. So um, I don't have an I don't have an objection to Danielle showing us a, a a a diagram for more information, but I do think we need to. We probably need to have them back in and certainly CPC. I'm imagining CPC is going to have them back in too, as you as CPC is trying to move forward on this warrant the, article. The CPC has met with the developer, I think about five times, and then we had the public hearing on this on April 6th. So we weren't planning another meeting with the developer necessarily. Um, I, I can share the screen to show that area. The, the septic is at the front of the site by Park Street and the riparian zone is at the back. So I don't know if that's helpful. It's about 400 something oh, feet away. Sure. Um, Mr. I can Gilberto, can Danielle, is it okay to, for Danielle? Do you have to give her permission or can she? She'll be all set to, to do so. Sure. You should be able okay. to I know it's late, so I'm sorry to ask a question. No, that's it's you you're you stuck with us. So I think, I think you were here for the previous discussion. We love trash. Yeah, we love trash. <laughs> I was say trash, but we have a lot of trash. Yeah, it's early. It's early for us. It's not even ten. No. <laughs> oh boy. Oh yes, Danielle. This is what we did not see at our meeting. Okay, so. This has more recently been prepared by the project engineer, and this would be looked at, of course, in much more detail when a site plan review would be done. But in terms of, you know, talking about um, where the step, so the proposed septic system is up front. Um, I don't know if I have a way to point, but um, close to Park Street. Um, and then the facility, mm -hmm. the actual housing kind of is here. in a T shape on the side. And then the riverfront area is behind that and it's the septic and the I think that the see this diagonal line going down here mm -hmm. that's that's the wetland line and I think that's the beginning of the riparian zone as well um and behind that so you can see the very dark area at the at the very back of the site is is the river itself mm -hmm. 
So it would be from my discussions with the applicant's attorney, um, it would be expected to be a septic system and not a package treatment facility. And so it would go through Board of Health permitting and not through DEP um, at this size um, with the 50 units. Um, and if there's anything I'm missing about um, the plans for the septic, I would, I, you know, I know the developers on the call, I certainly would defer to Mr. Wheeler to, you know, to speak to it if, if he wants to, but um, I, you know, it, I don't know any further detail with that. I mean, that's, that's just, that's, that's kind of the setup that they, that they have in mind right now. That's what the site plan, you know, would look like when it came in. So when you met with the developer, um, do you have, do, can you answer Mr. Mr. Valenti's question with respect to water treatment at the site and where that would be located? And um, So the septic system is up front close to Park Street. I don't know if you can see the, the notation on the plan right there, but it says proposed septic. Uh, under the parking area. Yeah, it's like, yeah. It's, it's see that area where there's a larger parking area and two smaller ones. It's that it's the, the larger parking area. It's his proposed septic system. And is there anything so, for drainage and, and runoff to prevent it all from going off into the uh, the river there? I don't think it's been designed yet, um, but it can, I mean, it has to go through, it has to go through all the permitting in terms of, you know, both Board of Health and Conservation Commission. So I, they have to meet all the standards. I mean, that's really all I can say about it. Um, yeah, without, no, you know, without the project having been designed, it's, you know, I, I yeah. couldn't really. Yeah, how does it get on the water? But it does not sound like from what, what was um, reviewed at CPC there, it does have a water, its own treatment plant. That's, it's septic. It's that's, septic. I think, the answer. Right. So, Thank you for so, sharing that. Unlike, you know, okay. Edgewood has its own you know, water treatment plant, or unlike the study that you've done for, you know, Winter Street, this one doesn't come with that. This has just septic as it's, okay. Um, all right, that's a lot of information for a warrant article, and we really appreciate your being here and giving us more information. Mr. Valenti, did you have any other questions on this? I just really had feel to, just had to unmute myself. Sorry, but yes. thank you very much. No, I, okay. that, that is great. Thank you. I have another hand up, um, but it seems like this this does warrant a little bit more, you know, for us to 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 be able to understand it at least to vote in favor or you know take a vote on it. But I have Mr. Latham. Yes. Hi. Hi, Madam Chair. Uh, Chris Latham for the applicant. Um, basically, we do have members of our team here tonight. The engineer is here. The LSP is here. Um, we've had extensive meetings with CPC, um, Historic District Commission, the FINECOM. Um, basically, uh, the question as to whether this is spot zoning, it consists, it consists of three separate lots and is consistent with both the master plan and also the housing production plan. Um, it was identified in, in the master plan that there is a serious need in North Reading for senior housing. And there was actually a notation made as well that locations for cluster housing or mixed use or pocket zoning, they actually reference the historic center that's actually listed in the, uh, in the master plan. Um, they go on for, there's pages talking about the need for senior housing in North Reading as it's a, a growing population. So there definitely is um, basically a public need and I, I believe it's consistent with the, uh, the master plan. Um, with that being said, the development is out of the riverfront. This, this site, as all sites along the Ipswich River, would be covered by the Massachusetts uh, Riverfront Protection Act. Um, it basically has a zone of protection on either side of the Ipswich River or any river for that matter, up to 200 feet. This is outside of that. The septic system that is proposed, um, uh, Peter uh, Ogren of Hayes Engineering could discuss it in greater detail, but it's 405 feet away um, from the riverfront. Um, and we're more than happy to come back for another hearing. If you have any specific questions for the LSP, the LSP is here tonight as well. I, no, uh, Attorney Latham, I appreciate your being here and I, I appreciate your whole team being here, but it was, it's not posted on our agenda. I, it, it, we're reviewing the warrant articles. So to, you know, to have a 
a full blown review when we haven't even notified the public that that's what we're doing, I think is a bit of an issue. But um, just in terms of what you just said, are those three, the three separate parcels that are the subject of this, are those all uh, the same owner? Mrs. They McKenna? are now, yes. There was oh, a Mrs. parcel that was purchased uh, recently and they are now part of the same ownership. Okay. There are three separate tax parcels. Okay. All right. So I, I, I mean, it's, I appreciate everybody being here, but it wasn't on our agenda to kind of review the development proposal, the warrant, warrant review. This is our <laughs> first path to the warrant, but I do think it would be a good idea. I don't know what my colleagues think, but are we, do we, can we concur that we probably need to hear back from, from, uh, <laughs> Everybody's yes. nodding their head yes. It's not a vote that we need to take. And we appreciate your being here, but I wasn't anticipating you all being here. So I don't know if my colleagues were, um, but uh, you know, we Madam certainly, Chair, would, it, certainly it, would like to hear back from you and hear more information about it. Even just what Danielle showed us, I think helps, helps edify. We do have to take a vote at some point on whether or not we're going to be in favor of or against against this and I think you can hear the issues at the that at least we have as a board in terms of it. Thank you Madam Chair that's basically that's why we were present here tonight because we figured you would have some questions. That's great thank you. And All right does anyone like, else have any questions besides me Mr. Mr. O'Leary? And again, I this is almost looked direct. like you were raising your hand no, but I, I wasn't I, sure. I am I am I am it's more directed towards uh, you know, Danielle and the, and the Planning Commission, and it's, um, you know, if, if we're going to rezone this for this purpose, I mean, it, obviously it has to be economically feasible for somebody to do something of this sort with this parcel, with their costs and overhead. You know, if, if through the, if this gets redone, you know, gets, gets approved, um, and it doesn't turn out to be economically feasible for the current proponent, um, what does that do for these three parcels in the center of our town for other proposals that may come down the line afterwards? If, if, it, if after they go through all the uh, permitting applications and all the public hearings and everything, and it's determined that um, whatever's going to be required of them as two owners from a financial standpoint, the property lies dormant in a new district. Is, is that what the Planning Commission has looked at? And anticipated. The underlying zoning of local business um, is unchanged. So if it's not financially feasible for the applicant or anybody else who might want to come in and go through all the boards and commissions and the HDC and everything that would have to approve it, it's still local business. So everything that was on the site already would be allowed to remain. Um, it would still be LD property. So it would still, so still be eligible to be uh, developed at a future date for a different purpose general business purposes. Yeah, it, the local business underlying zoning doesn't change. Doesn't change. Okay. This is an, an, an additive. Um, some overlays take away uh, and restrict further. This actually just enhances additional uses that, that are allowed. Okay, so it's, it's not a strictly rezoning it from one use for another. That's it's right. not substituting, it's adding to it. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, and the language incorporates in the ability for the general office use. I think there was a question on that, but it didn't expand it. It just kept it to what is allowed. It added, it put that right in this overlay. What's there right now is in this overlay too. Oh, I, I understand it was for you know, a mixed use type, allows for a mixed right. use. Commercial, retail, retail right. was, retail's the additive, right, Danielle? Retail is already allowed. Um, it has a few restrictions, and I think most uses in local business are special. I actually I have another slide that has all of the by right uses and all of the special permit uses. There are quite a few special permit uses that are allowed. Um, so retail, restaurant, um, there are many uses allowed in, in, in LB by special permit, um, but not multifamily. So. I think it'd be great. If, oh, and you go to a lot of meetings too, Danielle. I think it would be great if we could put this on an agenda, just this particular 
proposal and you come back too with all that. I think it helps. So, all right. Does any, <laughs> Mr. Walder, we're keeping Mr. Walder awake. So let's, we, we do he's have in the to same time zone. <laughs> I, know, I know, I know, but he's in the, he's, he's in the sunshine. So, yeah. all right. So I think if, if we can move on, was that the, are you here on another uh, zoning warrant? Really just one more, which would okay. be, so there's the citizens petition for Concord Street. The, the CPC yes. had its public hearing on that one, but it's not a CPC sponsored petition. If there were questions about it, I can try to answer them. Um, and I'll mention too, that the other article just has to do with revising the date of the zoning map. Should the other things pass, um, then we'll also need to revise the date of the zoning map. So that one is um, just a kind of a routine article. Okay. So this is Mr. Caviello's parcel that, mm -hmm. that um, town meeting that, that um, we were going to buy, but the town mm -hmm. said no to that. So right. this is what Mr. Caviello proposed and had proposed all along was to utilize the parcel, which is the, was the farm use, to be able to utilize the parcel for his electric business and vehicles and things like that. So that's what all this is, this involves is just basically allowing him to use it for industrial office. That's pretty self-explanatory. And he, mm -hmm. he told us and we knew, and he told the town that's what his intent was, but it, it has to be rezoned for that, obviously, which is, that makes sense. So does anyone have any questions about article, what's currently numbered article 32? I actually just have just wanted to make a note. It says sponsors community planning commission, um, but it's, I was just going to ask that. Yeah, that looks like an error. Sorry. Well, that's it. That is, um... Madam Chair. Oh, that's the zoning map. That's a different one. Yeah, that's a different one. I'm looking at Article Thirty Two. Yeah, yeah, it's Thirty. 12 to 14 Concord Street, LLC. That is a citizen petition for um, the zoning, the zoning. Article 32 is Mr. Caviello's. That's what I, that's what I thought. <laughs> so you, you're talking about article 33, Danielle. Go ahead and explain that one. I'm sorry. Uh, does anyone have any questions on 32? No. All right. Danielle, what the 33? So in case article 32 passes, we will need an updated zoning map with a, with a new date. And so that's what this article is for. If it doesn't pass or if it's passed over, um, we wouldn't vote on this one. The reason it specifically mentions for Concord Street um, is only because um, <laughs> in, in the Park Street petition, because we had a hand in writing it, we were able to put that right into the article. If that article passes, it automatically comes with a map update. This one we didn't write, so we didn't have the opportunity to add it. Um, and that's why it's- I ask you that, good. Okay, that's good. All right, anything else, Mr. Gilberto? Can we let Danielle go? Yeah, no, yeah. thank you, Danielle, for but taking- you can Come back. <laughs> Thank you for uh, doing most of my board member reports by explaining these articles. Now I don't have to talk about the CPC at all from last week. Appreciate it. Oh, we will. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Valenti, I think we would want to have this as a separate agenda item again and have the developer back and have Mr. Attorney Latham back and to have some more information. I think we had unanswered questions on it and we do have to take a vote to whether or not we're going to support these warrant articles and you know, make an explanation to the town if we do or don't, why we don't, if we don't. Not saying that we, we've decided that yet, but. All right, um, okay. Any other questions from Mrs. McKnight? Good, thank you, Mrs. McKnight. You're welcome, thanks. Hi. Good night. Mr. Gilberto, anything else with respect to, to the warrant articles that you wanted to call to our attention? No. No. All right, Mr. Walner. I just have a question about Article 25. I was kind of surprised to see that there. And that's to appropriate money for special counsel legal expenses. Because we always have that in every um, town meeting. And if there's not a need for it, we ask to pass over it. Okay. But it doesn't seem like there's a lot of motion going on right now. And 
uh, that's just because of COVID and the delay on trial and things like that. So, okay. so this is probably this is probably going to be a Passover, right? Correct. Okay. Thank you. A any other questions on the warrant articles that w as we're reviewing them? I, I do. I do have one, and I don't even know how you could do this, but I do want to make a suggestion for you to think about with town council, and that is we don't seem like we have a whole heck of a lot of time to spend those extra funds. And if we need some sort of pre authorization to, you know, spend them, I know as a board, we have to decide that. And as a financial planning team, we have to decide that and we're waiting for regulations, but are we left to have to come back to a special town meeting you know, to be able to appropriate to certain things. I, I think we should probably try to cover that with an article that gives us the authority or the permission, you know, with, with the oversight of the different, uh, you know, financial planning team, select board, et cetera. That we should have something that allows us to be able to appropriate that if, unless it's not restricted in that way. Um, so, okay something to that effect, um, just a thought. That's just my thought because we don't have a lot of time to spend it. And it seems like if we have to come back to a special town meeting every time we decide, okay, we could use it for this or that, once we do finally know, you know, we're in a tough spot right now having all these articles for the outdoor, the next outdoor town meeting, so. I don't know what my colleagues' thoughts on that are, but I think we should think about that as an article and somehow fashion an authorization to, to appropriate if we can. How much money are we talking about? $4.5 million, okay. potentially. We certainly are working on some, you know, improvement projects, infrastructure projects. We we know that we we have things that we'll, things that are we're working on that. And if you don't use the money, you lose it. So we really do have to, uh, you know, move move forward on what that should be, what we should be doing, what we should be doing for spending it, and how and have a plan and I don't know if we can have the plan before June where we don't even have the guidance, but right. maybe we have a placeholder warrant article. I think that sounds like a good idea. Can you dump it into one big project? If that becomes the case, if there's like X still left over and we can't just. We don't know, right? We don't know. I don't think we know. That. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it gave, it gave, like Mr. O'Lear was saying, it gave, <laughs> no, it, gave so, so it gave very specific things, but they were vague, vague things, you know, infrastructure, payroll, um, <laughs> water sewer was one, like specifically. So I think we need some sort of a placeholder that maybe we will have a plan by then together and that would require us to mobilize and put our heads together on it requires our financial planning team and our capital capital um, improvement team to put our heads together on it now of course we know the amount we know when we're going to get the infusions of it but um, we should really you know have a placeholder for june well and the other question is, is uh, you know you can't reserve some of this money for future debt service, I wouldn't think. So it's gotta be for basically capital outlay. And, uh, and again, if we reshuffle uh, reshuffle the deck in relation to, you know, some of our payroll, which is which is, can be covered by this, would free up cash for capital projects. So capital, you know, one-time capital outlays uh, that we would probably be down the road that we can take care of today. And it can certainly enhance things, but, you know, from a revenue loss standpoint, which is supposed to, which we get would replenish your, your supplies. We're not that much in the hole. I mean, it's meals tax and a few other smaller items, but for the most part, 
you know, our revenues are pretty good and pretty consistent still. So we've been fortunate. So, you know, so to me, it's if you have to shuffle the deck and cover some of those expenditures in, within the payroll area to free up cash for specific projects that we would that we have been putting off for expenditures, then that gives us the opportunity to do it. But again, I would just be very cautious to you know put it anywhere where we're going to have a recurring cost moving beyond the time frame involved. So because the money isn't going to be there to support it. So I, I think you know the administration between the school administration and the town administrator, I think they can get pretty creative as far as uh, being able to identify projects and things that need to be done with one-time monies that will cover, that can cover some of our already existing costs. That would be a good thing. Okay. Well, and then we need to get to work on that. It's too bad that with COVID, with everyone being home and with more trash put being put out that we couldn't use it as one time to cover the cost of the increase but we knew that was coming down the line we have to think think that way for like mr o'leary saying one time infusion here one time infusion there you mentioned that mr gilberto and it wasn't i didn't even think about it till you mentioned it everyone's home mm -hmm. so you know that but unfortunately, we were we we were suffering the you know the changes in the trash issues before before COVID. So anyway, but we have to think like that. You have to think outside the box for the use of these things. I think. All right, and are we all set with anyone else's recommendations here? As we're we're just doing a review and not voting at this meeting. I think we need to fine tune it, obviously. But does anyone else have any other recommendations? We took one out though, Mr. Walner. So we shortened it by one. <laughs> so, Done. I know. Anything else you have questions on? Are we all set to move on? Okay. Next order, well, so we're going to be seeing that again, refined, I'm sure. Our next order of business is um, minutes. I, uh, Chair Minnie Pelly, I missed one legal bill. Oh, so I can do that right before the minutes, if you'd like. Sure. So, uh, Madam Chair, I move to approve payment of $325 for invoice number. 01-21-002-1457-2 LC dated March 14, 2021 to American Arbitration Association. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Manupelli is aye. Thank you, Mr. Studo, for catching that. Uh, yep. Uh, Madam Chair, I move to approve the December 21st, 2020 executive session minutes as written. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Minnie Pelly is aye. Madam Chair, I move to approve the January 11, 2021 regular session minutes as written. Second. This is motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. And Manu Pelley. <clears throat> Aye. Madam Chair, I move to approve the January 25th, 2021 regular session minutes as written. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Walner? Aye. Mr. Studo? Aye. Mr. O'Leary? Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez? Aye. And Manu Pelli is aye. Madam Chair, I move to approve the January 25th, 2021 executive session and this is written. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Minupelli is aye. 
Um, before I read the next one, Mike, um, were these, uh, did everyone see, I think Mike sent it out the amended for March 15th, regular session minutes. There was just one sentence I had to clarify. Um, Madam, Madam Chair, through you, um, Mr. Sudo identified the percentage was wrong. It said 50% affordable units. It's actually supposed to be 15, one, five percent. That's right. Yeah, property. I, I, I wish that's a typo. I didn't have to take back, but that was definitely wrong. I mean, I don't know. Is the, no one's agreed on 50 yet. <laughs> so we, uh, we corrected those and placed them in the share file folder. So, so Madam Chair, I moved to approve the March 15, 2021 regular session minutes as amended. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. <laughs> Madam Chair, I move to approve the March 15, 2021 executive session minutes as written. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. And Kelly is aye. All right. Our Next order of business is the town administrator's report. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam Chair. The uh, yard waste drop off center opens for the season on Saturday, April 3rd. The center accepts leaves, grass, and brush and is open Saturdays from 8 a.m. until 4 p.m. I attached a copy of various public safety advisories regarding proper disposal of smoking materials and ashes. Um, safety and survival training that departments participated in, National 911 Education Month, and the North Reading Fire Department's receipt of a grant for safety equipment. Um, these are press releases that were put out by the departments over the past few weeks, and I put them in uh, the packet for your information. Congress and Moulton's office has solicited potential community and infrastructure projects for potential federal funding um, through the federal earmark um, process. So I, I did submit a series of projects to um, the Congressman's office, including fire department expansion and renovation, the Ipswich River Park maintenance and parking improvements, Arthur Kenny Field turf replacement, the Park Street bridge replacement, uh, Main Street slash Route 28 improvements as a follow-up to the study that was approved in October, Central Street sidewalks phase one, and um, wastewater collection system or sewer as a general application. I can tell you through my uh, many conversations and participating in conversations with the con congressman's office that um, the, the, the ability to obtain funding is going to be very limited, but I, I did want the board to know that I you know, put each of these projects before the congressman's office to make his office aware of um, what we're working on and what we're looking at um, in the future. Um, even if it's not current pending um, federal funding, um, it may be some future, future funding source that's out there for which um, one of these projects may be eligible. And then uh, finally, I included an update on the COVID-19 um, case numbers. I can provide an update reflective of this morning's COVID meeting, um, which showed that uh, as of April 10th, there were 1,271 total cases. The number monitoring is down from 84 um, to 55 cases with 1,192 cases recovering and um, at the 36 deaths, which is the number we reported uh, roughly two weeks or so ago. And that concludes my report for this evening. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gilberto. Any questions? Well, we're all set. We're either all tired or we're all set. <laughs> board, board member reports, Mr. Walner. Yeah, uh, just two things. One is, um, uh, following up on your COVID, I have a special request from the Forest Committee. They're asking for us to open up people meetings as soon as we can, simply because Zoom doesn't work for them technology-wise. It's not a lack of interest. It's just a, a physical limitation. So I, I know, Michael, you're thinking about that, and maybe it's a Board of Health issue. I'm not sure. But as soon as we feel comfortable, it would be nice if we could open up meetings again to be in person, especially for the Forest Committee, which is a special request and very small. Um, and then the other uh, the really good news is that um, Phil Hertz, as we know, has been working on the trail 
uh, Bikeway Trail. We had a meeting probably seven weeks ago with the Mass DOT. Uh, Michael and the lawyers were involved, and it was actually really sobering information that I had to kind of help Phil get up off the floor. He was feeling pretty down after the meeting because it was new information that really almost, I can't say it almost ended the project, but it was really looking pretty dour. Well, um, yeah, I, Michael has received this and Danielle has received this as well. Interestingly, um, our neighboring towns have now petitioned the MAPC to join us in working on a trail together. So Middleton, Peabody, Linfield, and North Redding, and each town has already written uh, we haven't, I don't think we've written ours yet, but this has been a surprise to us. Each of the towns have written that we want to create a regional uh, bike trail. And we're at the end of one of the, you know, uh, that bike trail. And if we get all the way through Linfield, which was prior to this, really never thought would ever happen. Now Linfield has had a huge turnaround. They want to get this property locked up as soon as they can. If we can get through Linfield, we get to Peabody, we get to the ocean. I mean, this is a huge, huge deal. So this is, I'll let Michael add more to it, but basically to get four towns to agree to a plan for mass DOT, when we met with them previously, we said, hey, listen, you can get four towns to do this. You know, it's hard to do, almost impossible to do, but if you can get four towns to do it, this would break open the project. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. And it was a bit of a surprise to us. So it's really good news and that, and that project is back on, uh, on track. So Michael, if you have anything to add, go ahead, but I think that's where we're at with that. Madam Chair, through you, um, only to add that, um, you know, that the town of Linfield has a uh, chapter land uh, right of first refusal to buy some land to come uh, just over the town border um, on the other side of the river, located in Linfield. And, um, you know, one of the reasons that it, I think it's relevant to us is because of the potential um, uh, impact it might have on a, a bike trail connection from North Reading to um, the Essex, um, I'm sorry, the Independence Greenway in Peabody. So, Certainly was something that seemed very interesting and you know, could certainly position us for, for success down the road. Um, we still, we have challenges here in North Reading. I think we're all aware of that. And, and um, those are things that we'd have to get through. But in terms of our project being a compelling project, should we be able to resolve those issues? You know, we have a, we think we have a developing path to connect to um, the, um, that's not intended to be a play on words, but we have an avenue to connect um, to uh, to the existing trailhead, so um, certainly very optimistic now um, that that there, well, there wasn't hope that we could make that connection. Now there is. Yeah. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Walner. Mr. O'Leary. Um, I'm not going to talk about the Board of Health anymore because again they're they're busy and the town administrator gave you the COVID update. Just in relation to Hillview, it is open, and um, people are golfing already. And in addition to that, uh, the administration is working with the commission um, to see if they can get uh, someone on a temporary basis to um, maybe work at the pub, you know, work at the pub open up. So it's, uh, that would be helpful in addition to uh, us at the cost of maintaining the building, the facility there. And, um, you know, as things loosen up and a little bit, you know, maybe then the, there'll be some interest in the pub. So. Um, so that's good news. And uh, other than that, I think we're all set. Thank you. Can I, Mr. O'Leary, are they advertising or putting out an RFP or are they reaching out um, to, to people to, to, you know, I, I know there was someone that bid on that previously and she was... Um, yeah, but they didn't, uh, no, no, they, they, they didn't, didn't want to do the they, whole they, thing. They didn't, they didn't want to do the whole thing. And again, at the time, uh, the last go around, uh, we had basically no qualified bidders that wanted to take it over. And then Mr. Yeber stepped in and again, was obviously uh, um, at a difficult time because of COVID. So uh, the last year has been very challenging for them. And that, so that license agreement has now been terminated and expired, actually would have expired April 1st. So uh, I'll, I'll let the town administrator explain exactly what the current thinking is in process that maybe we can go through. Um, but go ahead, Michael. Yeah. Through you, uh, Madam Chair, through you. Uh, yes, so they, they have actually advertised uh, in the newspaper for a um, what would basically a one, be a one season license agreement. So it's not something that technically needs to be procured under Chapter 30B, but they are doing it competitively to make sure that they're getting proposals. And they have four interested parties that have stepped forward and expressed interest 
Um, I think that they have conducted some question and answer with those um, interested parties over the past few weeks. And um, they're nearing the point where they're gonna be asked to submit something in writing um, for the, the commission to consider. Um, the focus is gonna be the temporary operation of the pub. It's not gonna preclude the use of the upstairs function facility for this season. We just expect it's gonna be very limited because of the gathering restrictions. It would, it would seem to me that, you know, for example, for the woman that bid before, but only wanted to do that one portion, that this would be ideal for someone like that or a catering business. So, and not everyone reads the paper. So where else can this be? Where else is this being placed to, is it on the website or, I mean, um, I, we do how, not have how, how are they reaching out to businesses in the community to just put a bid in? Because there's plenty of people that might be interested who, you know, want to, you know, make, who lost business during COVID and maybe they might want to try to put a bid in. There are a number of folks who actually reached out before it was even advertised. Um, I don't know whether it's word of mouth in the restaurant industry or what that, that caused that, but they were getting interest um, before mm -hmm. they even solicited it, um, which is certainly great to see. You know, um, you know I, I do think what they're seeing is people see the pub, but then they see the upstairs and they're much more interested in the upstairs than they are in the pub. But the reality is the commission's focus has been on providing that community amenity in the pub. That is going to be the primary focus of whatever happens. Um, to the point that you brought up, though, we could certainly put that up on that. Put that up. Put that up. Put that up. Uh, on on Northreading MA. North Reading MA. Yeah. 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 I think it's important. Think it's important. We have enough. We have enough people that have, that, have homes that have lost a lot of business that might be interested in making a go of that, and we should be looking to people in our own community that might be able to, you know, you know, make it make it work offer something to the to the golfers and make some money and get that place up and running and make us some money anyway all right thank you mr o'leary mr studo um well first i agree with mr walner about the in-person meeting not just for that committee but everyone and even if even at the very least we have a plan um Call me optimistic, but I think that things change so rapidly that you may not hear from the governor about it and then all at once get told, you know, you got one week left at Zoom and then you got to go back in there. So I just rather have a plan than not have a plan for lack of a better way, because I feel like that's how quickly COVID moves that, you know, today it's the end of the world. Tomorrow we're filling, you know, TD Garden. So it's like better to have a plan. And if we can execute it earlier, even better than that. Um the warrant articles took care of a lot of my CPC update. I'm not going to touch on Park Street because that's still there. Although I do apologize to the board that it wasn't my suggestion that they should come. And now the time has come to come to the select board and talk. I did not expect it to be during the warrant articles. So sorry about that. But it was me that said, you know, I think at this point, after talking to the CPC six times and two times to, or three times the finance committee, I think a bigger presentation to us would have been warranted. So uh, sorry about that. Um, and then- um, I have to apologize for, but I think it, it should be an agenda item oh. so that the public knows that's what we're gonna be talking about. Um, Concord Street, yeah. Uh, the only thing I can mention is that there was a concern by some that came to the CPC, which we will probably hear about at some point, if it's not a town meeting, that it's gonna create even more traffic and that some other farms might want to sell if they see what they can pull off, which, but, you know, just kind of a, we'll probably be hearing about it at some point about that. But again, you know, I think the voters spoke back in so, June, okay. was it Jul July? Whenever we had that town meeting where it got approved, where we didn't buy the turkey farm. And, um, and then the 5G, you know, again, it was, uh, you know, Danielle talked a little bit about that, so I won't touch on that. On the EDC front, interesting things happening. So there is a grant that is being uh, applied by the Reddings, <laughs> for lack of a better way to put it, to fund uh, marketing and advertising for businesses. Plus, we had 13000 uh, rolled over from the budget that EDC never spent that 
also going to be used for digital advertising and, and whatnot, you know, kind of the plans being finalized with a peer to peer in person outdoor event, some point in June. Um, assuming that everything keeps going to plan, and I do air quotes here with, you know, the Board of Health and everything. Well, more, I think, you know, I think you can have the certain amount of people, but it's a comfort level, right? I mean, the situation has to get better for people to want to go out. So, but it's kind of uh, the EDC just wants to make sure that businesses can take advantage of what we're calling the reopening momentum. I mean, I already feel it. Well, vaccinated people, I mean, cannot get through the door fast enough right now, I feel like. And I know a lot of different ages, including a lot of my clients who are in their 60s. So it's not like it's just young people dying to get out there. So kind of um, it just seems like, you know, we want to take advantage of the, okay, you might be willing to spend a little bit more because you haven't been spending anything. Why don't you go spend in local businesses in North Reading? Because, I, you know, the complaint about spending locally is always that, you know, they do have to price a little bit higher because that, you know, they're not Home Depot. So you got to charge appropriately. So we're just trying to take advantage of that. And uh, that's it. Uh, is there an event coming up on that? Um, it, it's not. It, it Preliminarily, it would be, well, scheduled for June. And it's, would be it's it. a business to business event? Or? It's, it's, a, it's a business to business event. Uh, just to not only exchange ideas, but just see if somebody has something that's working, you know, and, and even a confidence builder. I think that's the biggest thing to portray confidence that, you know, as things get better, I mean, I just, I, I, I think if you feel better as a business owner, if you see 30 other business owners all thinking your same way, because that's the problem right now with Zoom, it's really hard to gauge the community about a lot of things because not everybody's comfortable with Zoom or doing it. So yeah, it, it would be a peer-to-peer -peer event uh, and maybe it would also help advertise in September. There's the, um, oh, what's the event that's held at, well, could be held at Ipswich River Park. It's like a business fair. I'm sorry, the, the, I'm drawing a blank. Maybe somebody can help me with it. Town day. day. Town day, thank you. Town day. Um, yeah, so Public and, safety day, all these things that we missed during COVID. Yeah, so again, it's almost just a um, a lot of people seem to like, uh, you know, the event that happened at Kitties in 2019. You know, people like the, you know, that. And then we also, seems like business owners have been talked to. They don't want to do go get your own coffee and then go to Zoom. They'd rather, I mean, it seems like people are excited to get out. So, um, more updates as they come. Okay, that's good. And you keep us posted on the where and the when on that. Um, Mrs. Gonzalez. Oh, are you all set, Mr. Studo? I'm sorry. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, thank you. Mrs. Gonzalez. Um, just two things. Um, the Housing Authority, while I was away, um, some things came up. So I don't have all the details because I, I, I couldn't be involved in the first meeting and today they had an emergency meeting. Um, we're having a regular meeting tomorrow that I will attend, but there has a uh, grant has come up to share a resident services coordinator with Reading. Um, and so they were voting on um, going forward with that um, today. So tomorrow I will get more information on that, but um, it sounds like it would be a great thing. Uh, I don't know if you have inf more information on that, Mr. Gilberto, if you've heard anything about that. Uh, you know, only that I saw the agenda um, for the meeting, but I, I, I have not heard much more on it at this point. Um, usually that stuff comes back to me through Danielle. Um, it may just have not hit her desk quite yet. Um, yeah. Ms. Prenny, I don't think, I don't think we've discussed it, but I can follow up there tomorrow. I think it happened pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, so they were moving on it pretty quickly to not miss out on it. So I'll get more information on that tomorrow at our regular meeting and I'll report back on that. Um, and also the chair and I um, went to a retirement 
little kind of party last two couple weeks ago for Deb Pothier at the assessor's office. Thirty two years um, of commitment to the town, and um, it was really lovely. They they did a nice little very COVID responsible mm. party, um, and just to see the camaraderie in the office. And I I'm sure COVID has pulled them even closer together, um, but it was a nice little. Um, thank you and goodbye to her. <clears throat> so that's all I have. Many is of service to the town. She's a sweet, sweet lady too. All right. Um, do we have, did that cover all the new business as well? <laughs> okay, good. All right. I just have a, an update. There's some correspondence oh. from the chairman of the commission that uh, there's actually going to be an ad in the transcript uh, put out uh, specifying that the bid is for the pub only and only for the duration of the 2021 golf season. The upstairs ballroom is not part of it. And that uh, after the golf season, the commission is planning on putting the facility out for a formal bid through an RF, a five-year contract with a five-year option through the RFP process. So just a clarification as to what we were talking about earlier. So there will be something, um, an advertisement in the transcript um, going out also for solicitation. Good. Just one question on that. Mr. Studo. And Mr. O'Leary, maybe you have the answer. Does the, does the town, let, let's say the, the, the ballroom is not, is not a part of the deal, but things get better where, you know, we can use it responsibly late summer. Can the town directly rent that out or does it have to go through a vendor? I don't know how that no, works. No, 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 no. If there's, if there's a, a need for the facility, then, <laughs> The commission can consider it in discussions with the administration, you know, as far as what the use is going. Just as we did with the, I mean, the chairman, George Stack, again, giving him credit, um, suggested that the Board of Health use it for a vaccine site. Okay. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's available. So it's just a question of uh, right now, uh, the previous vendor still has some things in there that they're in the process of moving the equipment out over the next couple of weeks. So everything will be out of there that belongs to uh, the previous, previous licensee. So. Okay, thank you. And I just had one other question for the town administrator that uh, uh, did Mill Street. I quick thing on that bid though. I don't know if you are, are actively involved in that, but I know when they came back to us, we talked about that and they, I know they, they put, they lumped them together, which is why they only got one person bidding on it. And I think that's because the kitchen would have been a shared. Is it? Is that? Am I? Is the kitchen shared between the pub and the function hall? No, I mean there was a significant amount of money put into the kitchen in the pub, you know, to upgrade it. And I mean, it's it's, it's fully functional in and of itself, depending upon what oh, products yeah. you produce. I mean, the kitchen in the upstairs facility is huge, you know. So it's again, so the it's set up, you know, they set up for functions, and, you know, mm -hmm. mass production of food. So two very different type of kitchen operations and two very different operations. Uh, I mean, historically for 34 years, and again, it's been operated by the same individuals um, just because that's the way it went. And we had a difficulty in, in separating the um, liquor license for the facility. So that, that's part of the question too. And again, it doesn't necessarily preclude, preclude them from using it if public health regulations change and someone wants to have a golf outing and it's better off upstairs, they could have it upstairs, you know. Um, but it's not, they're not advertising it for the function hall. So at this, it's right at, now advertising right, for some a vendor to come into the pub. Just to the pub. Get the pub up and running. But when right. they put out the full advertisement, they should they should consider a, a, a global advertisement well, for the, one for the other for both well there's also um, discussion that there needs to be and there's been ongoing discussion for years as to really what do we want to foresee the use of that particular facility again there are challenges with that facility particularly with parking during golf season you know uh, how do you service a, a, a restaurant and a function hall in the middle of golf season it's it's difficult it's a challenge it always has been a challenge for anybody who's been in there as a vendor so, um, you know, some of the commissioners have some ideas as to, you know, maybe there could be a, a, a public use for the upstairs of the facility. Uh, something that should be part of the facility's master plan uh, 
is to you know consider it within the equation and is there a public a better public use for it rather than a public pi private partnership and just trying to continue on with what we've been uh -huh. been doing so it's um all, for years the whole idea of that um contract was just to cover the costs of maintaining the building it wasn't necessarily to make a lot of money on it because we never made a lot of money we were happy when the utility bills were paid and we were able to maintain the facility and put a new roof on it fix the siding or replace some windows and patch up the heating and the plumbing uh, with the income from the whoever was in there because the the overhead costs for that building and that facility are uh, outside of the norm for a restaurant and function hall facility just because of the building itself so, um, but anyway, so it's just, a, you know, can it be repurposed for some other public use or some other combination public private uh, use? But yeah. so a lot of discussions, a lot of ideas, um, but something needs to be done and decisions have to be made as to what do we want to see with that facility mm -hmm. and how do we want to utilize it? Okay, thanks. Mr. O'Leary, you had a question from Mr. Gilberto. Too. Yeah, just Mill Street. So I have had a conversation with the water superintendent regarding that, um, but I'll need to check with them on the status of it. Um, I know we talked about it back in January and um, I expressed to him that we wanted to try to move it forward, um, but I just, I need to check back with them to see where it stands. Yeah, yeah when I said, Mr., you know, we're sitting on a piece of property here in prime real estate season that uh, we no longer need and properties are going for top dollar and we could probably come very close to recouping our overall costs and still retain um, a significant portion of that parcel for future municipal use for whatever needs later on. So we've been sitting on it long enough. Okay. Anything else? I'm sorry. I'm good. <laughs> All right. No, no. That's <laughs> Keep things on the radar. All right. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Is muted. Motion yeah, to adjourn. I need to adjourn. Second. <laughs> Motion to adjourn by Mr. Tudor, second by Mr. Walner. Any discussion? Mr. Walner. Uh, my grandson, who I just met, and I say hi. Oh. Hey. Oh. <laughs> All right. That's why you're in Florida, huh? You got it. <laughs> that's oh, congratulations. That's great. Congrats. Mr. Studo. Hi. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. And Manu Pelli is aye. All right. Thank you, folks. Have a good night.